And the first business we have is a minor amendment, UD special permit for Johnson Woods. <coughs> Julie, do you want to say anything? Or? Um, sure, yeah. I'll give a little recap. Um, so over the last couple of years since I've worked for the town, periodically people from Johnson Woods will come in and sort of express some concerns about things that are happening on the site some of which aren't necessarily compliant with their special permit. Um, and about public notice? Public yeah, it, notice. and the public, I was going to say actually, so um, the public meeting notice that was sent, was sent to all the people who live in Johnson Woods and then abutters as well, it wasn't posted in the paper um, and it's not based on any legal requirements. Um, it was just a notification to people who live there so they can come and let you know of some of their concerns. Um, but basically what brought this to a head was the um, foundation was poured for a building on White Oaks Lane that is not, um, does not match what was approved on the original plan. It's, it's kind of, in my opinion, it exceeds the threshold for like what's something that can be done administratively um, because it's a somewhat different orientation location. Um, you know, more than just like a five foot change to save a tree. Um, so I thought that they should come in and talk to you and request a minor amendment for that. And then at the same time, we'll address some of the concerns we've heard about the parking in the multi-family buildings. Um, and you might hear a range of other um, issues, because I've, since the public meeting notice was mailed, I've heard from a lot of people who live at Johnson Woods about some of the concerns they have. So. Okay. Some of them, some of those are within our purview, but some are not. Right. I'd say um, most of the ones I've heard are things that relate to the parking or the structure that's um, out of alignment, and then there are some that are largely legal in nature, which really aren't your purview. Okay. So. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I believe I need to recuse myself. <coughs> My boss actually lives at 18 White Oaks Lane. Okay. Well, I'm not certain how that works. Do I need to leave the room? Do I just shut up? No, just make faces. Okay. <laughs> Typically, you would remove yourself from the days. You could stay in the room if you want. Okay. All That's right. been my experience, at least. Yeah, I would agree. Just yeah. that way, there's no perception that you're actually making out. All right. These statements, I don't know if it's being broadcast. You can never hear this broadcast on TV. So. <clears throat> okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. My name is Brad Latham. Ted Moore is here with me, as well as Bill Bergeron, who's been the project engineer from the beginning. Uh, this project started 15 years ago. I think before some of you were on the board, but I even some of you have a long tenure. Uh, this project's been very successful, both uh, for the occupants and for the town itself. The town generates about $1.6 million in tax revenue from this development, provides good mixed housing for the town. Uh, during the process, we used to come before you every time a, a twig moved uh, to get permission to tweak the special permit. Uh, as that time and order became uh, more inconvenient, I think, for everyone, for every minor change, uh, I don't mean minor versus major in that sense, but minor shifts uh, of different things, uh, to come back before the board. And at one time, probably about five years ago, there was discussion of, well, can't these things be handled administratively? Uh, the, proce the process has always been that the objective has been, as Ted has shown, to save trees, to preserve the topography, and preserve open space, and to lessen the impervious area. Basically, that's the history up to this point. As to the picture that's on the screen, we're dealing specifically here with buildings 52 and 51. And Bill can describe in more detail the nature of the change, but basically looking at this as a layman, there's a shift uh, of, of those two buildings slightly uh, towards White Oak Lane. The motivation for that is, again, grade and, and also to save trees that exist behind the structure that would be lost if it were placed in the original footprint location. The change results in a uh, significant decrease in impervious area and runoff from this area. Maybe you can do some more particularly. That's, that's the purpose behind it and the change itself that's involved. I think we've seen many of these over, over the time. Is, is this change from the units have changed, they've changed from quads to duplexes, uh, and that's been a more popular kind of style. So you've seen those changes as well throughout the project. So 
So can you describe the nature of the change? Sure. The, uh, the, the lighter one underneath is the actual approved plan that was approved back in from 2012, I think, that was the original plan that was approved. Up until that time, it had been more of a regimented with the triplex type of situation. So they were larger units or dense units. And when we came back, we did this circular driveway, we tried to um, create more of a landscaping area here, and ended up with the houses sitting further back from the roadway. When Building 50 was constructed, and the one that's adjacent to Building 50, which is 49 over here, um, Building 50 actually shifted over a little bit more. As you can see, it would be too close to this building. And that was because there was a, a stand of large trees between this unit and the next unit. So that the back side of that, this shifted over a little bit. It necessitated moving Building 51 over a little bit again. There's some trees back there that we wanted to save. And when we started looking at filling in the last two that were going in here, we started to rethink what this cul-de-sac turnout was going to be and what we were gaining or losing from that. And as it was indicated, we gained, we lose, we increased the impervious area with that looped driveway about 2,100 square feet from what was, what the new plan has. And we were losing some, some specimen trees that were in there. So there's trees that are right on this portion of the driveway that we're saving now that would have to come down with the loop driveway. And there's some trees in the front here that we're saving. And this driveway actually, I think it was about 84 feet of curb frontage with this. This basically cuts that down to less than half of that. And this was actually, if you, Remember in Johnson Woods, we have the visitor parking, which are just basically turn out sections into the off the roadway edge. <coughs> from, from that point there to that point there were designated visitors parking spaces. So this driveway was gonna remove those visitor parking spaces. So with this configuration, we're able to maintain those three or four parking spaces that were there as visitor parking spaces as well as a net reduction in the impervious area. I think this building is maybe 40 square feet bigger than the one that was previously approved underneath it. Uh, but the reduction in the driveway, as I indicated, was over 2,000 square feet. So it's basically a net reduction. That's allow us to save more trees. With the shift of this, this original setback from this building to the closest point of that building to the closest point of that building was gonna be, I think, 40.1 feet. It's now 30.7 feet. Our requirement for this site is building to building. We can't be more than closer than 15 feet. And that's typically what some of these other ones are. This one is 17 feet. That's probably 17 feet there and probably 25 feet in the back there. So it's, it's consistent with the overall design and the parameters that were the PUD was approved at. And we thought that this was a more attractive save more trees, had less disturbance in the back where the bulk of the trees are, so we had a smaller footprint towards the back of that unit, and we're able to save a little bit more, even though that the, the unit does go back as far as it was. It, it, didn't, it didn't project the full width of the, of the structure. And that was what we were thinking was basically just a minor modification, kind of within the parameters that we had talked about before, and we understand that this was a little bit more of a shift than the 10 foot shift that we would typically talk about like when we put this building adjacent to that building. But specifically it's, it's in keeping with the style of the other houses that are there and it's basically to break up what the alignment of the buildings look like. Uh, two plans of land included here. One which says it's showing the proposed foundation for 52. Yeah, the proposed is the heavy on this one. We overlay, the building inspector wanted us to overlay one over the other to show what the discrepancy was. No, so you have you talk. both of them. Okay. So this is 
overlaid. Yes. And this is just new. No. Nope. They're different. I don't know which new new is. I don't know which one I'm supposed to look at. So this one shows this sort of combined straight driveway. This one shows a separate up driveway. Yeah, the, the June 18th. June 18th, July, July 18th versus September 1st are two different plans. This is this is the one. Independent driveway. <clears throat> let me let me just make sure. That's the way we were going to do. We got it with the right. So that's that's the July 18th one. On, up on the uh, yeah. screen so right the, now. Yeah. The July. I'm sorry, but the one that you have, the September 1st, is the correct one. So do we have that one? Do you have that one? Yeah. There's the. There it is. The I didn't know we had both of them. This okay. is this is the proposal. All it did was instead of joining <coughs> the driveways, this separated the two driveways. Everything else is the same. <coughs> Do you don't think that's going to be a problem with the front unit? Um, how long is the driveway in front of? I assume there's a garage there. I don't have a plan. Yeah, it. twenty feet. You don't think that somebody visiting the front unit might block the back units? Garage? That's why we want to save these spaces that are in the street here. Shows anything. So there's spaces in front. Street parking? Yes. Marked? Is it all marked? <laughs> My is a parking space. All throughout Johnson Woods is the step back in the first line for visitor parking. Where is the oh, little pull off? Yeah, the little pull off there in front of the building 52. Okay. Comments from the board, commission. <clears throat> well, the I noticed as uh, as Nick did that there were some uh, several different ways of handling the driveways. So, uh, did we hit, did the board of selectmen come up with something recently, a change in the handling of shared driveways? Not that I know of. Okay. The. Uh, because I'm not sure how the access slash ownership uh, is set up to handle the, the, the shared portion of the driveway, shared access. Is that the only driveway that's like that? It's a condominium, so they're asking how do you, how do you divvy up the shared access? You know, more than half the units have shared some sort of shared parking because it's kind of negative. Okay, so it's it's not it's not new and unique to this particular change. It's something that you've dealt with previously. Right. Okay. Well, let, let's let's explore that a little bit. <coughs> okay. um, so the, the difference here, right? These spaces, I, I can't tell because I don't know what these buildings look like. Right? These are different than what anything you no, brought before us. No, we built the same building twenty-five or thirty times. 52. 52. I don't see anywhere else with that footprint on this. It's the same building. It's just slipped. The same it's, design. It's this building with just just. They're all this, all those this buildings. This is cut in half, and if you just push that pot forward and that pot back, that's that's that building. 50, 51, and 52 are all the very, same. Building. They're very similar. Okay, so the garage into the I'll call it the southern portion of 52, that, uh, I mean the driveway on the southern portion that goes on to 52, no, the uh, no southern one. portion. No, only two units. So. No, There's the only two units, so the other pick one. the other one. Well, south is this one, so. Oh, I'm sorry, north. Um, that goes into the garage? <coughs> yes. So, in fact, garage. these are, it's, it's, it's the garage, time. There's a few places where the garages don't come from the front, they come right. from the side. So it's turned. It's the not turned. The garage is in the same place. 
just go in from the side, like if you looked at... The garage would be here. It's, it's the same box for the garage. It's just the, 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 20 the by side 20 instead of the front. So you, the garage door, yeah. where do you the pull garage in? Door the garage door is rotated 90 degrees. Okay. Yes. So, but the, the garage door is on the side instead of the front of the house and the, right. and the, uh, the right. unit, and right. there it's on the front <gasps> instead of and we've, that's, okay. that's happened a few other times. So here's, here's the issue, is that unlike um, the one next to it, you pull in, you back out, right? If you're, if you're a driver, you pull in, you back out mm -hmm. on both of those units. Like the 51. 51, right. yeah. <clears throat> so if I fill up my garage with stuff, and I, I park out in front of my garage. Uh, now my neighbor pulls in, and, in, and typically you can pull in, pull out, not a problem. Here, you can't do that. No, each. Because I need that space to, to back out. You can back out without turning. You may have an option if, if the. It, and that's why that's different. When you say it's shared, everyone else, every other, when I look on here, everyone else has sort of a straight in, straight out. Here, the use, if I use, if I'm in 52, and I use my driveway or that space in front of my, my garage, anyway, however I want to see fit, I'm washing my car, what have you, that's going to impact how my neighbor uses the driveway. We have a similar situation in... You, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm, I'm saying we have a similar, you could back out. I mean, you can back out, but you may be able to turn around and drive out. That's, that's not dissimilar to what exists today in building um, down these two buildings. You have one driveway and they share that. On 720, they have the same thing. You can see the driveway down there. On 720, which is over here. There's one driveway, one goes this way, one goes this way. And they both have side. They both have side <coughs> entrances versus off the street. This one has a side entrance. A side, deep side garage door. So there's, there's other places where there've been side, where we where we could alleviate. The whole idea initially was the reason we started out with one car garages was because we didn't want to have a streetscape dominated by garage doors. And so, whenever we had an ability to have a garage door come in from the side versus the street, and you could have less garage door um, visible from the street. There's not a lot of cases we've been able to do that, but whenever we've been able to, we've taken the opportunity. So rather than having a garage door facing the street, you have a couple windows and a clabbered house. So it just looks, there's less garage and more house. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost the same amount of impervious though if you ran the driveway straight into that front unit right off of white oak it's not, it's not much more bill's saying it's less but i didn't do the calculation no what he's saying is that driveway yeah, went back this driveway. oh right 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 it's, it just seems to be a better arrangement that way the two units are really separated well you got <coughs> you have to you have great issues then right so this, so the fact that the driveway <coughs> leaves from a higher part of White Oaks and has more distance to go to get in the house leads for a, a, a less steep driveway. We're going down. Slope yeah, you down. Go, as you go, the, the O of Oaks is four feet higher than the W of Oaks. I'm not sure what the crown is doing. Really. That concept has been used, I'm familiar with two uh, other projects in an effort to get garage doors on the side and not on the front. Caldwell uh, Farm in Newbury, uh, English Common in uh, Topsfield. Uh, it's been very successful. The streetscape is more attractive by doing that. And as Ted said, if the owner of the southerly unit is not parked in front, you can, the owner of the, of the north unit can back out and, and come straight out. If they are there parked, they simply back out onto White Oak, which uh, any driveway backs up. Yeah. I'm sure that'll cause some issues someday. <coughs> 
Um, I think the biggest thing, though, is that these are just poured, right, in a different place than the plan allowed, right? You, you place the foundations, you place the foundations in a different location than the approved plans. Yeah, that's, that's probably happens in every house we built on. But to that extent? No, no, no not to that extent. But we've, we've, been, we've been back to the board 15 times for minor modifications since 2005. And I would, remind, I would remind the board that in 2000, the summer of 15, I think in June of 15, the board, having studied every house we'd ever built, unanimously approved the location of every building built, in, <coughs> including building 50, which had been moved over to save some trees. So, so we couldn't, we in fact couldn't build 51. If we built 51, where it shows in the light thing that we'd have been five, three feet, five feet away from 50, which had already been approved. So we have to move it over. We would have to move it over in order to meet the setback of 15 feet between buildings, which we've uniformly observed. No, I understand that. I just don't think it, that it, it was probably not presented that way to the building inspector when the firm was put forward, the, whatever the process is. As a change. I agree. That's why we're here for I can tell you that this building inspector made, made somebody, uh, this project I was working on in town years and years ago, and the building inspector made those foundations come out before, before he checked the holes. And they were simple footings. He made them tear them all out. Um, but my concern is more that when, when there's a shift like that, that it's there, there's more impact to something else, let's say like a wetland buffer or some other more important um, criteria of why things were set up a certain way. I want to make sure that all that stuff is tracked so it doesn't come up later on. Yeah. There is no wetlands within... No, I understand that. Yeah. I understand that. But, you know, potentially a uh, shift. So, I mean, there's a lot of wetlands on the <coughs> thing, right? And maybe not your project, but another project. <coughs> the plans are approved a certain way. If there's a change, it should be notified so that... It's unusual a project would take 15 or 20 years. Yeah. We've been at this. This is our starting our 16th year. And I think the actual the business here before the board was at 21, uh, at some point 21 to 23. So we are pretty much familiar with the uh, territory. comments or issues from the board or staff. All right, I'll take some public comments. Um, Are you gonna sorry. take public comments just on this situation right here and then talk about the parking yeah, situation? Yeah, I was gonna, or uh, you wanna, have you? I'm afraid it'll drag Maybe out. Maybe just do piece. one piece at a time. Yeah. Okay, I think that might be. So, this is how public comments work. Make sure you've signed in, either now or, or before you leave, so that we can get your name right from the record. Say your name and address and address all your comments <coughs> to the board. And let's see if we can't stay on topic for this particular change here, and then we'll talk about the other parking, okay? okay. <coughs> my name is Joanne Bogia. I'm an artist and an interior designer, and my husband and I have lived in Reading for almost 40 years. I'm here tonight because in late spring, early summer, we were to be the new residents at 52R White Oaks Lane, the house in the rear. We were moving to Johnson Woods for many reasons, not the least of which was being able to design a new home for this chapter of our lives. This was to be a fun, exciting lifestyle change for us. We negotiated with Mr. Moore and his associates in good faith. Despite all the warnings we received all the way through the process by residents of Johnson Woods, including my own sister and brother-in-law. I chose to ignore all the rhetoric and decided to place value in our, on our experience. Well, that blew up in my face. The first sign of being misled was when Mr. Moore took us to the lot that seemed to fit what we were looking for. We assumed, because he didn't state otherwise, that there would be only be one duplex townhouse on the lot, ours and the one attached to it. After giving our initial deposit, we found out through a third party that there was a duplex, <laughs> that there were two duplex houses going on the lot, four homes. I was very upset and went to town hall to verify. I was given a plan dated 2012 showing four homes. 
Although I was not happy that there were four homes instead of two, after meeting with Mr. Moore and having him stake out a footprint of the proximity of our home to the other duplex, we decided because we were in the rear, part of the rear part of the lot, we still had the privacy we were seeking and went ahead with the PNS in good faith. As a designer, I have put many hours into this project, paid seven thousand in architect's fees to implement my ideas, fifty thousand deposit for PNS signed in May, and not yet returned and numerous legal fees to resolve this. I am telling you this so you can understand the scope of what this man has cost us. In early September, when I was noticing that nothing seemed to be happening on the lot after the foundation was poured, I started questioning what was going on. My questions were evaded, as were my initial calls to Mr. Moore. It wasn't until October 13th that he told me, quote, there is a problem with an Iranian doctor who is not happy with the placement of the home attached to yours. In my mind, talking with Mr. Moore and meeting with him, it seemed like he was not telling me the truth. So it was then that I went down to the town hall and found out there was a deceased and deceased order because he, <coughs> order, he had never, he, because he had never had filed the current plan or gotten the town's approval. We could never move forward with this project, even if the town does decide to let him continue. When he received the order from the town, as a developer, who was also an attorney, he had an ethical responsibility, if not a legal responsibility, to inform us of this town order. We have not heard from him since October, and at the very least, not even apologized for all he has caused us. As a designer, it is my opinion that this was a situation of total greed. He could not have put the size home that we negotiated with him for or that he has on the law at present if he stuck with the plan he gave the town in 2012. They simply wouldn't have fit. This has nothing to do with Mr. Moore's statement that he was saving trees. That is simply a cover for his own greed. My presence and statements in here tonight will do nothing to repair what we have gone through. My hope is that this planning board will start to scrutinize Mr. Moore's future developments with this town so that others may not end up in the same position. He also lays claim to the money Johnson Woods contributes in taxes, but I am sure that the property would have been developed by someone else at some point and perhaps someone with more moral character. Uh, well, could I have an infinite? Hold on. Oh, so how are the lots broken up then? Um, I thought it was just so all one big lot. Development with one big lot. lot. There are no separate lots. Okay, so when you say that, um, when you talk about the lot having only one duplex or two duplexes on it, mm -hmm. what do you interpret as the lot? The lot being, when I was showed the lot from the beginning, the lot was what you see is the the two that are connected, the fifty the fifty two R and fifty two front. Those are connected by the corner. That and the house beside it is also a new duplex. That's a that's two du that's two homes. When we were shown the lot, I understood that our house and the house attached to it by the corner would be the only two there. And it was then later, as I said, that we found out that there was going to be the other duplex. So when he mapped out the way the lot would look on the plot, we stayed in the game because it truly seemed to still give us the, you know, the privacy because we were in the rear. Wasn't I, it wasn't what, the optimum for us, but it, we accepted that. So when I refer to the lot, I'm referring to where the location of my home would be. So building 51 was not shown? No. She's saying that the board is what she was supposed to do. Until I came down, Julie, and I spoke with you. I right. beg your home And then you gave me the 2012 plan. Right. This is the plan that's been sitting in my office and was shown as included as Not part of the town. Though, this is the plan that's been sitting in my office since the summer of 2015. The houses, the ones in green and houses that are construction now, that's why they're outlined in green. This has been the plan that's been there 
This is attached to Joanne's PNS. So this is the house next door. That's her house. This has been sitting next to my desk and has been shown to Joanne and her husband. The lawyer. Joe Tarby was there, saw this plan before they entered no, into the No, did you see the plan? He said, I have talked to him. Was, no, he also did not see uh, that. Okay. On the There's no way for me to know that. So he, he, he was sitting in my office, office and he saw this. He saw this. Plan. Plan. No, he didn't no. see the plan. No. Okay. I'm just trying to understand what yeah. they were yeah. interpreting the law was. No way. Yeah. yeah. If I could give some. Can I have your name, please, sir? Is that okay? Your name? Yeah, I'm sorry. Derek Dyer. I live at 26 Johnson Woods Drive, and I think that uh, Mr. Moore referenced our <coughs> homes relative to the uh, access to the driveways and the garages. We, well, I, I can give some background anyway, because when we bought our home, we've been there four years now, and uh, I had to have a pretty serious conversation with Mr. Moore relative to the way the driveways were, were done. It was too tight. So uh, ours is a long driveway, and we've got two units on the left-hand side, much like the lower, lower unit there. So you've got to turn into your driveway. Well, the actual driveway, as you come off the street in, was too, too short. And there were a couple of big boulders, so you, you didn't have enough room to back out this way and then drive out. So after much discussion, we were able to widen the driveway. But I can see with this unit here, you're going to have a lot of problems getting in and out of those garages uh, relative to if there's a, another car in the driveway. You're expecting people to back out all the way out of the driveway into the into the road. Did you say it's, 26? It, it, you yeah, said 26 Johnson? I'm the 26 Johnson. Okay. Yeah. We were talking about 27, 28 when we were talking well, about Well, I don't think there is a 27, is there? We are. There's 26 and 28. I'm 28. She's 28. <laughs> I'm 26. You good? Sort of a shared driveway. Yes, yeah, it's a shared yeah, driveway. That's 26. Or the shown as 26. But it's upside down. I'm sorry, yeah. And we come into the front of the 26 is a duplex with two independent driveways. 27 and 28, uh, from Mr. Moore said earlier, we have a shared initial driveway and it splits off into each unit. This is completely different. This is not, this is not, this, I live right here. This is called Yard Place Where? right here. Right, this is the entrance to yeah. Johnson Woods. Right, my driveway is here. This is all wrong. Oh, hold on. I'm 26. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, are so the building, um, building numbers and addresses different? They're not, they're yeah, different. They're, they're different. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So what, so what it is for me is I'm right here, right? Okay. And it comes in and units of this is Joe Let's try to say on this particular um, issue here, I guess. I just, if I may say one more thing. Sure. Mr. Moore spends a lot of time talking about trees. There's plenty of people at Johnson Woods who would like to be given the same consideration. There's plenty that goes on, and I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. Mr. Moore has a lot of people very upset at Johnson Woods, and it's probably one of the reasons they're here tonight to talk about this with the planning board. And all we would hope is that you hold him accountable to the law, the deals that he makes with the town, the placement of the units, and that he lives within the parameters of what you guys agree to. That's all. Okay? okay? Thank you. <coughs> um, my issue does not specifically pertain. I think to we should the issue stay on this. Yeah. Okay. Again, there are a lot of issues that are sort of legal and not really relevant to this board and these two issues. So my issue had is. Um, I didn't get your name. Um, excuse me. My name is Mary Elizabeth Canning, and while my issue is not pertaining to this, and I happily stand aside for others who would like to speak about this particular issue. My issue is a, an issue that what I'd like to talk about is a planning board issue. Okay. Uh, a general planning board I issue? Know, okay, I think we can take that coming later, but I know there are other people in the room that want to yeah. talk about this specific building. All right. So I think we should focus on this. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Tim Doyle, mm -hmm. uh, attorney in Linfield Law Office of the 26 Main Street. Field. Um, I represent the owner of the um, the dwelling that's 
there's one of the dwelling units that's right below uh, building 52. Um, and in review, a lot of what these other folks have experienced, my client experience, he's been an owner uh, at the site for about uh, three years now. And uh, in preparation and installation of that foundation, um, a significant tree line was removed. Uh, the tree line along the rear of his property, which provided him privacy. And in contemplation of acquiring this property, he relied on plans, the site plan that had been re approved by this board, architectural renderings that had been presented or were on file with the sales department um, at the site. And, um, and as a result of the shifting of, of all these buildings, what has happened is he has become one of the few units, if not the only unit, uh, in the complex with no rear yard privacy. Um, I will give you a copy of the architectural drawings, but if you look at almost every unit, they have bought some kind of vegetated land. Typically it was pine trees or oak trees of some sort. Uh, as a result of the shifting of this particular foundation for building 52, that's been taken away. Um, if you take a look at case law, um, any person who purchases based on a site plan or, appro or, appro or approval from any kind of uh, board within the municipal municipality, municipality has a reasonable right to believe that that's what's going to be constructed. Um, in this case, it wasn't what was constructed. In fact, what was constructed um, was a significant or major, mod I believe falls as a major modification under your zoning bylaws. Um, and to, from my client's perspective, it's more of a case of, we'll go ahead and do it and ask for forgiveness later. Um, and as a result, it's really compromised my client's use and enjoyment of their property. Uh, I do have a letter with some more specification in here, but in the interest of time, and not to duplicate a lot of what these other folks have said, uh, I won't go through it in detail, but I should, certainly will leave it for each board member. Uh, I'm just asking the board to take into consideration the material impact it has had on my client and how it's compromised his use and enjoyment of the property, as well as a question of whether it has um, compromised the value of his property. And it's our position that had this plan come before this board, before the permit was issued, before the foundation was poured, uh, this board would have taken into consideration the impact it had on all the units uh, in the complex, and specifically the impact it had on the, the building it most immediately abuts. And I think that that in this particular case, the developer just went forward and did it and figured they'd ask for forgiveness afterwards. And any representation that's a minor modification is, is in, simply inconsistent and incorrect. So if I could first the board, I'll give you sure. letters as well as some photos showing the before. The, the uh, foundation went in and afterwards, as well as renderings and plans that have been presented previously. Can I have one? Thank you. So the condominium, condominium documents say that the Location of buildings, the design of buildings are subject to change as different phases are brought in. So from that perspective, on a property rights point of view, there was no right on the part of any unit owner to be assured that what is behind them and next to them has to stay the same, again, under the common concept. Secondly, we talk about a tree line. The only change by, by way of any natural vegetation is that little area right there. And I'm not sure there's a tree line in that area that's of any significance. <laughs> right now, if that were, if that building was built the way it is shown in this plan, the back portion, 
what this unit owner sees is a car parked in the parking garage, uh, a driveway, and the side of a garage. Right now what they see is the side of a garage. So there's no great sight distance that's being interfered with as a consequence of that change. Other questions on this, or comments on this particular piece? Okay. Yes, sir. I'm Larry Healy, I'm a resident of 16 Green Meadow Drive. I've lived at um, the property now for just over two years. I've uh, been able to work with Mr. Moore during that two year period of time. And I'm fully aware of some of the, uh, the minor changes that he's proposed in other building areas and so forth. I think what is being presented here tonight by he and the engineer, in fact, would qualify as, again, a minor change. What I've seen for the most part is the changes that have been asked for or made, okay, in fact, for the betterment of the full community and not for individual owners. And I would suggest that this modification would fall within that uh, purview as well. Yes, sir. My name is Jeff Howard. I, I live at 113 Johnson Woods Drive, and uh, I've, my wife and I have lived there for, for 10 years. Um, and have been involved in informal governance committees uh, where we've had to interface with Ted about the property. And I will tell you that in the 10 years of experience, including several fairly tense exchanges where people had complaints that were brought to these boards, the, the present one is called the Property Management Committee. Um, and in talking with Ted about those issues, what we discovered um, contrary to other things that have been said here, is that he always behaves with integrity. He has told us the truth about uh, the, the positions that he's taken and why he's taken them. There have been all kinds of altercations over trees. And uh, we once did a, a several hour, a couple of hour walkthrough of the property, looking at particular trees that people wanted to, to be removed and that Ted defended. So I don't, I don't recognize a lot of this lack of, of integrity and honesty that I'm hearing uh, discussed here. It has not been my experience. Aren't you lucky? Uh, uh, probably Aren't you yeah. very fortunate? Thank you. Very fortunate. And your life wasn't turned upside down. Ma'am, please. Yeah. Do you want to move on to the parking issue, or yeah. do you want to just listen to other random comments? Mm -hmm. from I the really don't want to listen property. to other random comments. Uh, you know, that's why they have lawyers. That's why we all hate lawyers, but I should say. Um, can we, okay. <coughs> um, I, I, I would like to take a moment of your time, and I hope you'll give me that privilege. Okay, would it be better to listen to this before or after the parking issues on the um, multifamily? Well, I'm just, um, I, my statement is one quick paragraph, okay. and I wrote it down to be respectful of your time. So um, thank you for the opportunity to speak at tonight's meeting. I'm Mary Elizabeth Canning of 162 Johnson Woods Drive. In 2011, I purchased a condominium from Redstone Realty, which is Ted Moore's company. Under the purchase and sale agreement for the condominium, condominium they were supposed to build a second garage. Um, that was six years ago. That has not happened. Um, they have not fulfilled their commitment. I've been working with them in good faith to select a location for the garage that is likely to be approved by the planning board. Mr. Moore wants to put the garage in my front yard. Um, what's interesting listening to this conversation is that would remove a tree that would obliterate the vision of the site of my house and put a garage as the front, as the site of that, which I understand is a goal um, of yours. So we would, we would in fact be taking away two of your goals by putting the garage in my front lawn which would um, prevent you from seeing my house um, and also we would lose some green. Um, the location on which he insists to um, on which he insists is likely to inspire opposition from neighbors and therefore reduce the chances that the board will approve the garage. It is as though Mr. Moore is trying to set us up to fail, that is, to propose a location that will be rejected so he doesn't have to incur the expense of building the garage he promised. Thank you. So when you say garage, you mean like a multi, a one-story multi, a one multi story, garage? One-story, one, one single-car garage. Independent? Independent. 
Where'd that go? Which In my building? front I know, yard. Which, um, exactly where I told her we'd go when she bought which, uh, which building is your address? Because I don't know the address. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so I'm 162. Johnson Woods here. Johnson Woods here. So why don't I see 162? Well, these are building numbers. Well, not yeah. address numbers. Mm -hmm. so I, this is. This has numbers on it, but I don't, I'm not sure I know. Oh, I don't, oh, here I am. 161, 162. So this is my house. There's this um, nice grouping of trees here. I always expected that it would be placed, certainly not in my front lawn. I don't know any person who's saying, which I consider myself to be, that would agree to have a garage put in the front yard. Um, so I assumed that it would go somewhere after these trees here. Um, it, it would appear to be on, on our larger thing, would be building six. Is this the... I'm sorry, I just don't recognize it's that six. familiar enough. Building number six. Tell me which building number it is. Six. Yeah. Six, building six. Six, building six. Building six. Yeah. Okay, this is garage. garage four. Come right back. Thank you. It would be right here. I told her I'd build it. <coughs> I could build it here. If wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, Assuming wait. the planning board would approve it. Wait, where's my my you, unit's you, you here? Unit's right here. And this is where you stay. No, right this, here. No, I stay too. Okay. After, I mean, that would be more than I'd be happy with that because that was what I understood you to say. So I'm glad you have that drawn right there because if the planning board would be kind enough we, we, to we, approve we have, that, yeah. I'd be happy with that. We'd need to have it. Need to have that's a future board. building. That's a different change. So thought, anyway, that's I the deal. I thought that was going to be a multi-car garage. Yeah. No, it's supposed to be a single car garage. Okay. Uh, I've gone to the point of having an architectural design firm to take on location and dig safer. But the location is in the middle of my garage. Okay, so the multi, uh, what's the next issue? We're looking at the multi-family. Which building? Buildings um, 30 and 39 Taylor Drive. Which is building, <laughs> yeah. building 660. Sorry. These guys? 67, 68. 66. Oh, 66, so it's less than I can find. Yeah. 66? Oh, that's fair. Mm to these parking spaces is that um, they're so narrow people don't realize that they've been deeded a compact space and maybe don't drive a compact car and have trouble getting out of their cars. Um, so the approved plan was for um, a little bit more than two spaces per unit and the spaces were supposed to be 9 by 18. I believe these spaces measure, mostly measured like between eight and eight and a half feet and with um, some closer, many closer to eight feet than eight and a half feet. And was there some stipulation about how many compact spaces? There, not that I've seen, but the, the approved plan that I saw had said that all parking spaces are supposed to be nine by 18. This plan that's on the board is not the I was hoping you would send me an electronic version of the one that you wanted me to show, but I never got one, so. I didn't. Well, I thought this was this was supposed to be delayed because we were only going to talk about 51 52. Oh, we don't have to well, talk about it if you don't want to. Well, no, no one on staff said that, so I don't know why he has that impression. I can tell you this is a colossal waste of my time. Yeah, in the He's got We've got so much other business we have to get to. Draw the plans, build it to the plans. And what what you you said that back in twenty fifteen you had this this is plan, you, you had you have an updated plan here from twenty fifteen it was true. It's not this plan that's on the screen. You approved an updated plan. We provided you with that back there in twenty fifteen. It has it's quite different than what you see on the on the, on the No no no, not this. I'm going back to the to oh, the okay. um to the um to the foundation. 
Yes. You said you had the, the, the plans in that layout in 2015, right. yet you never came and got that approved. I mean, which is that part? The foundation for building 51 and 52. Right. What we're really here no, for. I'm saying, I'm saying so, June of 2015, everything that had been built to date was approved, including 50. But you said that you had a plan sitting in your office since 2015 that showed the location of the footprint for 5152, which is right. different than right. what so, so, we have approved. So, so if you had it then, okay, why so have we? Time out, time out. Why two years? If you look at, if you look at the, so the plan that we filed with you in 2015 yep. was probably filed in January of 2015, okay. and it finally got approved. I believe it was June of 2015. Sounds right. Th that summer, this plan emerged with what we think are, my, you know, again, further minor adjustments. And it's been sitting, sitting, <coughs> and, you walk, and you walk in my office next to my desk, and, and she, part of Joanne's PNS, part of what her lawyer saw, been sitting right there for two and a half years. And anybody that comes in, everybody that comes in, say, what's happening? I show them that plan. Done. Except yeah. for anyone in the town, that's well, that's to, to Nick's point is it didn't have to get to this to, to this. I don't, dis I don't disagree. It didn't have to get. To this. My my history had been we made minor we made minor adjustments for ten years, yep. and every single one was approved or approved next post with a discussion. No, no, from yeah. two thousand. From two thousand. I sat here. We've had discussions about every single one of your your changes. Some of them went through quickly. Some of them we said, yeah, go ahead. It took five minutes. Some of them took a, a good half an hour, an hour discussion. So I, all I'm trying to point out is there were, so we were here 10 times. There were 30 changes made. Okay. And yep. the other 20 came in in 2015. You looked at them and said they're all fine. Yep. So, I, you know, so I'm not disagreeing. I, but we've been here a number of times. And there have been a number of other changes that we've made. The big things we changed, like going from quads to duplexes, we came in and yes. talked to you about. Yes. Moving Thank the building a little bit, we have it every time. And I just, every year, planning and building wants to have an update of what was constructed during the mm -hmm. year. And there is a plan that's done, and this was the latest plan, to show which units were constructed, where they were constructed. But these were all consistent with the 2000, when we came in 2015, basically, we said, look, this is where everything is now, and that, it was yeah. actually this plan. And you said, all right. In fact, the actual decision said, the way they appear on the plan, the right. every, yeah. we're just blanketly approving that, even though a couple of them shifted around a little bit, that was basically we're just approved. And if you remember correctly, when, when we were talking about 67, the last time we came, it was because we we eliminated one of the units on Green Meadow Drive. We want to put a community center in this one. So we said, all right, we're going to take one unit there and put it in there. And we took the units from Green Meadow Drive and we put it at the end of Talbot Lane. That was kind of the last shakeup of where things went. And in the interim, we originally these, these buildings didn't have uh, a compact. All they had was we were rolling out the containers and there was a rubbish storage in each of the buildings. Then we ended up, when we were talking about all of this, we ended up with an actual compactor building to service these three buildings in the center of this, which resulted in a reconfiguration. That's why the one underneath or on the board is different than this. This was what was approved and this was what was constructed other than the fact of a spacing of the parking spaces, which is what I think we're talking about. These garages and the compactor was built, this is all constructed <coughs> the way it was constructed. So t tell me what the difference is with the parking now. Count, uh, do we have the same count? We just have smaller spaces? No, so we have, so we're, we're required to have two spaces per, we have an excess of that but we still never have enough. People always want more spaces. So in the layouts, when we, we would measure between two, you know, we put in the, the front entryway, the granite curving, we'd measure the amount of space we had and adjust the width of the spaces to get an even number of spaces in that particular area. And we have, have to look at the, 
our average spaces, <coughs> if you look at all the spaces, are, we have, for building 39, we have 87 spaces. We're required to have 76, so we have 11 more than we were supposed to have. And they average 9 feet 2 inches in width, and they range from 8 feet 1 inch to 12 feet in width. And why? Because everyone doesn't wear the same size shoe, and everyone doesn't drive the same size car. 12 foot wide parking space, though? I mean, that's, a, that's a handicap space with a. We have, hand, have handicap. No, I'm not counting handicap. No, I'm just telling you that that's what that is 12 feet. That's the aisle plus the parking space. That's it. Say again. A 12 foot wide parking space? Yeah. We, we have some 12 foot wide parking spaces. Because that's what the. We have a garage there. That's what we got. A, the garage is a 36 foot wide. If we have a tandem space, the space is 12 feet wide. We don't put four spaces in 36 feet, we put three. So they vary in width, <coughs> they vary in width from eight feet, two inches to 12 feet in width. Yeah, okay, I understand. And, they're not, and because of certain topographic steel columns, you know, they're not all, it's not like we have a big open, um, you know, co uh, hot top parking lot. We tried to hide as many cars as we could. So we have, you know, twice as many spaces under cover as we do out, as we do on the surface. So, I, so we wrote this memo. In summary, we exceed town requirements both the number of spaces in the case of 39 Taylor. 63 spaces are larger than town standards, whereas 24 are fewer than town standards. We we could make spaces wider and lose some spaces, but that that's counterproductive to what. Other people want sometimes, which is I want. They want more parking. If you need more parking on the site, you find a location for parking spaces that makes sense for people to park in, and you come back to this board for approval. I don't think that the math makes any sense that way. I mean, I understand you're saying the average width is nine feet, but that doesn't help me park into an eight-foot spot if I have an SUV. So I don't know that that's that, that makes any sense. The uh, I think the objective here is is to take the existing pavement and, and reasonably maximize the parking on it. The alternative mm -hmm. is to put more pavement on the site, less in the green area, and thereby keep the same number of spaces. The fact is, even if the spaces were all made of a different width, he would still meet the zoning requirement. He has excess. I think the number is for 30 Taylor, uh, there are six more spaces than required by zoning in number. As to 39 Taylor, is 11 more spaces than required by zoning. What's interesting in the zoning, by the way, and I'm sure you know this, is that in the gateway area, compact space is eight feet wide. Uh, in the PUD section, it talks about parking being 8.5 feet wide, parking stall. That's not defined. I assume that's the same thing as a space. It, but for definition, it could be the same thing. Your special permit says nine by eighteen. I'm sorry. Your special permit says nine by eighteen. I'm just I'm talking about the practicality, the usability of the spaces. I mean, if the requirement is to repaint them all to be nine feet wide, you do that, but lose spaces, still perform the zoning. Is that really in the best interest? Not if you want to do a site visit, how you want to deal with it, but we, we want to get to a resolution as well as you. When you say, because. <coughs> When you say by the zoning, what are you talking about? By your permit? By the approved plans? But what are by zoning bylaw? Yeah, so that doesn't necessarily apply here, right? I mean, you have a permit, right? It's, it's PUD, <coughs> and right. there's some requirements. The the what's in the zoning bylaw for for this particular site? Correct me if I'm wrong. Really, is irrelevant. It's yeah. what was approved. It was what was approved. Because uh, if we want to go back there, we can go <coughs> back there, but, you know, you, you don't want to. Um, uh, it was what was approved, what was approved for the site, um, the site plan, um, and, um, and the, the PUD agreement. So, um, and like Nick said, I think they were all, they're all my feet. So I, I guess what I don't understand what you're saying is when you say there's, You've provided the required spaces in, um, uh, uh, what's the required spaces? Is that the required spaces you kept referring to the bylaw? Is that the required spaces or the required spaces that's in your um, uh, approved? Are you talking about width or number? Number. No, two, per, two per unit. That's all required. 
I don't know. I don't know what's in the bylaw. I know that we're supposed to do. Yeah, no. Two per year. Yours was, I thought it was two plus. Yeah, there's a little. It's overall the site is two plus because it includes the visitor spaces. But, yeah. Two per unit plus yeah. visitors. But the number is irrelevant if the spaces aren't useful. No, I agree. You got to rather see a better breakdown of the number than than average to figure out how many of them really aren't useful spaces. Well, I guess that gets this into the definition of defining what's useful. Some places in town, eight feet's okay, sometimes eight and a half, yeah. sometimes nine. So when we're doing uh, smart growth stuff, we are catering to a very different clientele than I think is purchasing at Johnson Woods. Uh, they drive different vehicles, they have different commuter patterns. There's a lot of different things about that. They may not have cars. I can't imagine that there are very many people living here who don't have cars. Well, we. One of the things we've done is we, we give people, assign people a number of spaces, a license for a number of spaces, but the location of the spaces can be changed by the condominium based on handicap, based on vehicle size. We retain the ability to read. You can't, you get your two spaces, but you don't have two written in stone forever. The condominium has the ability to reassign the location of your spaces from time to time to deal with things like different vehicle sizes or handicap parking. If somebody's got a medical issue, they need to be near the elevator, we reserve the right to. Nobody owns a space near the elevator. We've got reserved the right to move somebody over there that needs it. And be careful. Those are the documents that Brad did 13 years ago. I think it's also important to note, Nick, that spaces under a certain size are typically marked as compact spaces, so people know what they're getting deeded. I guess the, uh, the question would be if eight and a half would be an acceptable. Granted, the the, the uh, plans say nine by eighteen, and that's what odd designs all show nine by eighteen on the But if eight, <coughs> if eight and a half by eighteen is an acceptable width, we can get some additional spaces on that. Look at the parking lot right outside here. All of the spaces in the parking lot are eight and a half. They're not marked as compact spaces. They're all just eight and a half. Some are even smaller than that. They don't have a special permit that says nine by 18. I understand. I mean, part of the decision was, you know, or some other menial I think, resolution for that. I mean, you can certainly make them all nine by 18. <coughs> I was going to say that I think that for me, I need to look at this a little more because um, we've got addresses and building numbers that don't match up, so I'm still trying to get oriented. Some are indoor spaces, some are in garages. I understand the limitations of changing those, and I'm not saying it's going to change those. It's probably just surface parking, striped surface parking that might need to be uh, thought out. Could I ask one question? Uh, hold on one second. Other questions from the board or anything? Is there an actual, sorry. No, go ahead. Actual layout of parking plan you can give us to actually take a look at? I can't see that from here, even with my super glasses. <laughs> the approved plans all have the, the requisite number of parking spaces that were approved on the plan. But I don't have a record, I don't have an as built that shows me which ones are 8 feet, which ones are 12 feet. Yes, that was one of the things that she was asking for. I think that would be helpful because then we could see whether there is, okay. you know, it good. might not be as many changes as we would think. Yeah. Um, Why don't we come back and give you that? All right. Uh, uh, anything else? Sorry. Right. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, one quick question. There's still a lot of buildings that are due to go in. Uh, all the parking spaces account for now, or will there be additional parking spaces to accommodate the growth of the complex? To answer that, when I look at this plan, if the white the white buildings aren't built yet? Yeah, the, the easiest answer is that in the first three or four years, all the buildings, all the townhouses, other than building, other than the two 12-unit buildings, which were early on, the you know, first two garden sale buildings, all of the carriage homes had a one-car garage and one parking space behind it, so every unit had two spaces. We, as think as plans evolved, we were able to redesign 
the units such that for the last five years, I would say, or maybe six years, every building we've built has had a two-car garage with at least two spaces behind it. So we've doubled the, we've doubled, we're, allowed, we're supposed to have two spaces per unit, but we have now, for the last five years, we have provided four spaces per unit, which has alleviated, you know, a lot of the, there are some people that had three cars, so now they've got a place to put the third car. So the, the plan going forward, we don't, we don't have plans to build any single, I'm sure there'll be an exception somewhere, but we don't have any plans to build any single car garages with single spaces behind it in the future. We plan to keep doing what we've been doing, which is two car garages and, two, and two, at least two spaces behind it. Does that answer your question? Not really, but that's okay. Okay. There, there are no more... Um, uh, I would say multi-family, multi-family, multi-unit uh, multi buildings like the ones on the um, yes. Yes. Guard building, guard building, building 66 buildings. is is the one under construction. <coughs> and that's supposed to have all of its planned parking assigned, uh, uh, allocated. That's the other buildings. That's correct. Hopefully not the same as the other buildings. Well, but these are going to be. We're going to do some sort of evaluation here. And, Look at the okay. dimension. The nine spaces and the seven spaces are all nine by 18s on the plan. I know, yeah. but you have a hard time building to the plan for some reason. I don't have a hard time. You know, if a tree starts growing, you're going to move the space. I have a hard time so. with the lines that are in what I give them for payment. But when we originally came, we asked, we, we came in September and asked for this in the building 52 and 51 to be resolved. And it just ended up being that the original, the original thing that we came in really with the 66 was because we ended up with that extra unit in. We were talking about this extra, trying to get extra parking spaces. So we had modified this building to put one extra space there, one extra space there. And the end of Talbot Lane, we ended up just extending parking spaces there. So we ended up getting three more spaces there and one more space on either side to make up for the units that were coming in to this building that we hadn't accounted for. Even though on its face it still had enough parking, we were talking about, well, even taking one unit out of here, we were still talking about people wanting more you parking. You didn't have enough parking. Mm -hmm. yeah. My name is <clears throat> Laura Newmeyer, <coughs> excuse me, and I live at 30 Canada Drive. And of our two parking spaces, one is uh, one of the outdoor surface ones in front of the building, <clears throat> and it is eight feet wide. And we have, um, I don't remember the name of the car, so I, have, I know ours is clear. <clears throat> On one side is a Subaru Forester PZEV, a crossover SUV. The other side is an Acura MDX, a crossover SUV. And it is very hard to get in and out of the car. And uh, we've already been dinged once. I have to say the resident <clears throat> who parks next to us was very nice about it and felt very badly about it. So there's no hard feelings about that. But I don't understand how somebody who, it's hard enough for us <clears throat> as a couple with no children I don't understand how you could get in and out with children or a lot of groceries on that. I'd also like to point out that <clears throat> of the um, total number of <coughs> units for the 30 Taylor Drive, um, 11 of those spaces are standalone garages. None of those garages are ever allocated, as far as I can tell, within the price of a given condominium. Anybody can have them if you pay $49,500 for those spaces and those garages. Uh, does that throw off the math at all? <coughs> I'm sorry, what? I'm asking uh, Ted or, or Brad. Uh, so could one unit buy three garage spaces, or are they limited to two? The garage spaces, you, you purchase the garage. You can purchase garage spaces, I assume. Typically, typically if you have a one-bedroom unit, you, typically you get one space. There's only like one or two one-bedroom units. Okay, so no one could buy two, up. If you have two bedrooms, you get two, one in and one out. All right. 
one side, one outside. There's some, there is some extra inside spaces which some people prefer to take two inside spaces, they give up their outside space. Some people want an attic and a 12 foot by 20 foot uh, freestanding garage with an attic that they pay extra for. Sometimes they have a space, but sometimes there's also a tandem space behind it. Sometimes they're not, depending on which, whether it's 30 or 39. Yes? May I just add to that? Um, <coughs> we were allotted one space inside the underground garage. So we purchased one of the surface ones there. But in order for us to get a second space in the inside garage, we would have to pay an additional $25,000 plus, uh, and that would, well, you take the value of what we paid, 19500 in the service, and then you have to pay an additional, I think it's $25,000, to cover the cost of an extra um, inside garage. So you can't just trade and move in. You have to pay something in addition for it. Huh. If you want two inside spaces, it costs more than if you have an inside and outside. That's true. I agree. Okay. But everyone gets two spaces without any additional charge. And unless you have a one-bedroom unit, remember the two-bedroom unit gets two spaces, no additional charge. Okay. Other comments on that particular, on um, this uh, multifamily parking or the open surface parking, parking wets? Okay. Can I live at 39 Taylor? I'd just like to mention that there's not enough uh, visitors' parking spaces either throughout the complex. Well, if you're going to give us a parking plan so we can see the widths and counts, can you just indicate which are visitor spaces? Anything else? John, you want us to bring that back to your next meeting? Uh, <coughs> yeah. That would be useful. Can I continue this? Yeah. Okay. So, um, January 8th, you can continue it to 8.30. Okay. 8.30 on January 8th. 8.30. Move that the CPDC continue the public hearing for the minor amendment for the POD at Johnson Woods until Monday, January 8th, 2018 at 8.30 p.m. <coughs> Is there a second? Can we get that plan a couple days before that so we can actually analyze it? Uh, you seconded? Yeah, I, do we have a copy of the 2015? That's, I keep kind of flip, looking through. We keep referring to the 2015 approved plans. They're up on the board, etc. Like, is, it's, is that it? Um, this is a document, I believe, that showed what was constructed uh, to date. But that's just an occasional document that the the plan that what I found asked us. I will email tomorrow. I just, I'm trying to you, you create a, a, a timeline of what's going on, and you, I don't you have I feel the, like I'm missing the blocks. Plan here. It's a long yeah. file. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I have extreme difficulty trying to do the same thing. <coughs> okay. So. so that's, I'm just, I, I second the motion. I just, I'm okay. So the, this uh, meeting won't be noticed again. Um, but you might have gotten a notice for the previous one. It's January 8th at 8.30. Uh, can we vote on this, please? All in favor? Yeah. 
Wait, so maybe I should take it and scan it tomorrow and then email it to you? Do you mind? That way I have it too. No, that's okay. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure that we have it. No, it's okay. It's just a little bit better. I just want to put it in the middle. Thank you. 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 Th
That is basically the uh, major changes on the site plan. The, the, the rest are um, they're, um, oriented the same. Um, they stack sequentially as they go into the site. And if you remember, there's a um, grade change from the street going up to the back of the site. Um, if you want to go to the um, elevation page, please. The separate one or the? Um, separate one. I'll just, I'll just quickly go through. The um, plan layouts are um, largely the same, where we have canyon garages on the ground floor with a little entry vestibule up to the first living level, which is living, dining, living room, um, kitchen. Um, the, the next floor up, if you want to I don't know why it won't fit on the screen. That's not, that's not really any better. The uh, second um, living level is uh, two bedrooms with two baths, and then the attic level is a finished bonus space. Um, where before we had a dormer on the residential side, and now that we have removed that, um, again to um, mitigate some of the massing that was towards the residential side, it also made us compliant with the uh, two to one zone design uh, ratio, which is stepping the massing back we're looking for us to do. So um, the plans are pretty much the same as the um, original um, submission. And the separate one, this one, um, or just further? I'll just go to the, okay. I'll go to this one first. These, okay. And then um, the last, so um, on the left here is the street front, and on the right here is the elevation facing the residential butter. So we were able to keep a lot of the architectural detailing, a lot of the architectural elements and facade treatments we tried to use to break down the mass of the building. We kept those in as much as we could. The bigger ones that we removed was uh, we had a, a gable dormer um, on the side of the building, which was again facing the uh, residential neighbors. As you can see here, we're now, by removing that, we're well in compliance with that two to one um, height um, and massing breakdown. Um, the other thing we would do we, uh, to reduce the building's height to make it compliant is um, we changed the pitch to a shallower pitch, uh, which reduced the height. We've also taken some floor to floor height out of each floor to get us to be height compliant with the zoning requirement. So the zoning requirement is 33 feet, we're at 32 nine. And yeah, Julie, if you want to go to that site diagram. Sure. So, uh, we, the suggestion made to cut, create a, a graphic to kind of help illustrate um, our proposal within the site context. So, these first three, um, if you, to get situated, you have Main Street, as you move down Chapin Street, so it's like you're standing in Chapin. Main Street's on your left. Our proposal is in the middle, residential butter. Waterway Terrace and then the remainder of the street. So you can see there's a, a topographic change as you come down the site. Um, but what we're showing here is a series of diagrams here. The first one is our proposal compared to what's existing um, with the Mission of Deeds building to our left and the uh, residential home to our right. Um, this next um, diagram below is what could be a buy right project here. So if someone was going to redevelop this in the 40, apartment 40 zone. A 40 foot structure could be put in. Um, if we put in one with our business use, I believe it would be 45 feet. So when you go to this, this next one, um, there's an overlay of what could be um, built there and what we're proposing. And as you can see um, on this side, what could be um, proposed in the 40 zone um, versus what's there now. So. This, I think, shows that the proposed project is really um, in that mode of a um, transitional project for the site, where we're trying to be a buffer to um, the larger parcels that could potentially be larger developments, um, and, it's, and it's trying to mitigate some of the um, larger structures that kind of protect it from the residential side of the street. This last one is just um, rotated 90 degrees, so what we have here is Chapin Street right here, and then the rest of the hill coming up, there's the uh, two family to our rear, um, and then the, the same family home to our, across the street from us. Um, what's important to note here is, you know, this is a very deep um, home, and it's not too far off from what we're proposing here. 
And um, again, with the height, comparing it to what's existing on the site, the ridges of the proposal and what's on the street are very similar. Um, again, um, this, the proposal that we have is not fully um, taking advantage of all that we would be allowed on the 40 yard guidelines. So that's it. Which, which one of those shapes represents the 40 R? So we uh, we are the 40 R pretty much uh, project. We could be as a residential project with a pitched roof, but pretty much the height branches off. So we would be allowed to go to a zero foot setback. We've held it off for build other building code um, windows and such. So. And then 15 feet is the minimum setback on this side, but as you can see, we're uh, pushed over. So this is like the almost like the footprint, even though this is an elevation look. This is the footprint that we would be allowed. Um, our proposal is uh, within that. That's what I'm asking you. You yeah. think that that rectangle represents some building envelope that you're allowed to build to? Um, out of the building, uh, the base zoning. Business B. Business B. Yeah. Right. So build it. We feel this is a stronger uh, transitional project for the neighborhood than. Um, <coughs> business B lot has been there for a long time, and nobody's even made an attempt to build a business B. So I don't know that that's necessarily what somebody would do. Nobody's interested in doing that. It's been a business, I think, <coughs> used as a business for. Yeah, last not, not so for somebody to go and invest in a brand new building, maxed out in its envelope. Um, I have my issues with this layout, and it, it, it's actually in plan. And I think it's because you're using the wrong form. You're, you're forcing this townhouse form, which is a very economical form to build, to max up. And it doesn't work in plan. Julie, can you bring up the site plan? I guess the colored one. I'm trying to figure out why it, why it's not working, and that's the only thing I can come up with in the amount of time that I'm willing to invest in designing this thing again. So the way this plan would work is if you could fit visitor parking on the right side of that driveway and still be able to swing into these driveways. But you're maxing out the building and you're not allowing yourself to be able to do that. So we end up with this, this trash collecting alley on the left side, right, which can't be used. If you're in unit two, three and you come down that deck, you have to go all the way around the entire structure and back down the driveway to get to the street. I wouldn't buy that. There's a couple of doors, I think, that come out of the garages and they come out under the deck into this little three-foot alley that I can't go anywhere from because the stairs block me, right? So you moved it over to try and improve the, the east side, I mean, the, um, yeah, that's east, right? Yes. The, the right side of that, I mean, and I appreciate that, but I think you need more space. And I'm wondering whether a different form works better, something at an angle. You know, if these units were angled where you could, you could pull right into those pieces, maybe that works. But you know, you, you've committed so much to maxing out the building envelope that it's just not fitting on the site right. Those spaces need, uh, those buildings need a temporary, uh, temporary parking space because that's what's going to happen. You know, the reality is someone's going to want to use, drop something off. They're going to need to park somewhere. They're going to block somebody off, or they're going to park on the street. You know, that's, that's, functionally, that's what I see in plan. Um, not happy with the envelope, but you know, I'm not going to design that either. Um, I understand you're within the limits of what you're allowed to build, but I think that you're, you know, you've squeezed it all the way over. It's kind of horrible on the left side, and it still hasn't solved the, the vehicle problem. <coughs> That's what I see. And then to add on to that, you know, you've got tandem spaces, so, you know, um, uh, all these people, uh, these, these folks uh, jockeying cars around, which is what you have to do with tandem spaces um, sometimes. <coughs> and, and know where to stash that other car. You know, if you're in if you're in the southernmost unit, 
you're going to pull out and block someone else or park on the street. And that's hard in the winter. I mean, you really can't functionally use these tandem spaces with <coughs> that, um, with the 17 foot wide um, um, driveway. I mean, it's, it really, it's just, it's too, um, it, it's, too, it's just too much. It's not, it functionally, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. That's, that's the biggest problem I have. I can't even get off the site to deal with any other issues yet because that's what I see. I see it would be perfect if you could get four, four parking, parallel parking spaces on that right side and still have enough room to turn into the, the spaces, then all of the units would be better off because they'd have a visitor parking space when they are both in the garage uh, and they'd be able to shut the cars, you know, potentially park temporarily outside as the other car comes in. So you'd rather see one dedicated garage space versus two, and then have the no, same ratio. I didn't say ratio. that. I don't think you can get. No, all you, of that. you can't because you keep thinking townhouse, right? This is that townhouse construction. But I'm saying, I'm saying, you know, if you could, if you had enough room there, right? You know, this is not to scale, of course, but where you could. You know, swing into these units. You know, this is a full aisle here. That's that's what I'm trying to suggest. But, okay. You know, we're thinking this maxes out this mm -hmm. townhouse thing, and then this site just isn't helping you. And you know, this is just <coughs> at least this might give you a little niche for something potentially. You know, privacy too. Mm -hmm. so, uh, private space back there. So that's making this. This is. Porch actually just goes into garage. It's not even the entrance to a building. So in that in that scenario, would you be okay with not a two-way traffic? So you could have back out from the last unit all the way to the street. Yeah, again, I'm not I haven't figured everything out yet. I'm just looking at the, the plan you presented and the, the problem I see. Right. I don't know the exact solution. But well, you do have the ability to, because you keep proposing this bonus room upstairs, you actually have the ability to change the shape of these units and still get the same number of bedrooms. Right. In, in your thought process, are those tandem parking under the building? Yeah. Okay. Uh, would you need to have four on the right? Could you have two? That would give room for a turnaround for at least two of the units. I don't know. I mean, you got 74 feet of space, almost, right? It looks like it, it's. Yeah, I, I don't the know width is what's get. limiting that. So, you know, the feedback we've been hearing is, you know, greater driveway width. So, well, I mean, can we stop there? The driveway width you had before just didn't even didn't work. So it's not that the, you we've been requesting greater driveway width. We need a drive. We need a driveway that's functional because you had 14 feet before. You couldn't even, you, with 14 feet, you you can't pull a car out in that space. So seven, eight, 18 feet is actually the minimum. You're at 17.5, so yeah, you know that probably uh, that yeah. probably can work, but 14 can't. Yeah, so we have 17.5 now with two feet to the property line. So there's some you know wiggle room on on how that. You know, it's going to actually functionally work. Yeah. I think, unlike what we've heard earlier today, this is, you know, intended for a, s a smaller vehicle clientele. This is for a community clientele. We're not looking for ex or expecting um, larger vehicles. No, that's true, yourself. but you're, you're setting these up to be three, three person, three car homes. Mm -hmm. I can see three young people splitting, you know, one of these units up. There's three bedrooms in these. Yeah, they're, yeah, perfect. they're perfect yeah. for that. I'm not saying you can't use them like that, but that's how they're going to be used, and so we have to make sure they're addressed. And yes, Brad, you're right. My quick arrangement like that makes some difficult vehicle movements with the backup, but it's not meant to solve the problem. I'm just trying to show you that right. if you had some parking on the side, it would solve the visitor problem, and it would solve the, uh, the way people use their cars now. You know, run in real quick. I forgot my keys, or I forgot this, or whatever. I have to pull all the way in, or pull the other car out so I can get the car with the tag on it so I can park at the depot, you know, something like that. I just think that they're, 
it, it's unfortunate because it's a it's a weird site. It's a rectangular site. You'd think it'd be easy to solve, right? But it's just got the wrong proportions, and these units are really big for that. <clears throat> can, can we listen to any other input you may have, and then that'll yeah, help absolutely. Us know where That's to go. just my opinion. I mean, they Thank might you. be all for it. No, nope, thank uh, you. Comments from the <laughs> from the commission. The uh, the concern I have is that it's just um, too tight for the for the space. I mean, there's, I understand that the 40R is a minimum for resident only, residential only, multifamily. It has a requirement of four units or more. Uh, so, that, but the site doesn't support four units, and what you're proposing is basically four large units. Four and a half baths, or three and a half baths, something like that. So you've got two full baths on the se on the uh, second floor, and another full bath on the, on the top floor, uh, and you could end up with like six people living in each of these units, you know, 1,800 square feet, and it's just uh, it doesn't fit in that location in uh, for this particular use. And what happens if you went to three three bedroom units? Mm Hard -hmm. to think of it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, probably not. Um, mm -hmm. No, what is it? A four unit minimum? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's something we can Sorry, can't hear that comment. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I, the, uh, um, under the particular zoning um, uh, that they're using, I don't think they can go to it. Three-unit development. I, I, I had I had suggested um, going to three three-bedroom units, but I don't think they I don't can do think that. they can. But I I guess the the point that you're hearing is you know if the if the usable square footage is smaller for for each of these units and not having to be two-bedroom plus all the bonus space and everything and dedicate some of that space that, um, you know, I mean, to providing a, a little bit more um, access and functionality and not having such a big square uh, footprint, I think you might be able to get something um, for units and still get something just not as big. Uh, not that these are tremendously big, it's just a small site that doesn't lend itself to this. That's my opinion. Yeah, I mean, it's the, without sketching out uh, the things, if you dedicated the first floor to the, the parking garage, as, the, as we've done in some number of the other cases, maybe it, you can get the, the space that you need. Um, you basically, so that instead of carving up the first floor, you make that a, a shareable space. I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't live there myself. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the one making the decision necessarily. Yeah, it changes the look, I understand that. That's different construction too. You'd have to build a fire right. fire deck, right? Um, yeah, part of the part of the reasons why I went with this kind of aesthetic was we thought it would be a little, you know, a little well received as a building typology. Um, you know, <coughs> say you know, podium with uh, shared parking entity. Sometimes other things might come to mind. So I understand that's a alternate solution though. Good. Yeah, I mean, I think if you if you were to do that, and I'm not sure I'm in favor of that necessarily, but if you were to do that, you could probably keep everything above that level the same, mm -hmm. as far as aesthetic goes. Mm -hmm. And then if you do have a, you're going to have a fence along that line, right? Correct. So that would shield whatever the bottom of it looks like. That mm -hmm. um, so wouldn't be as offensive as just having it wide open. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you guys. Let's take comments about. right after we finish. Um, so, sorry, go ahead. I'm not sure what you guys are referring to. Sure. So, um, 
if you think about typical 40R, much higher density buildings, right, to build a parking garage. No, I'm talking about the four units threshold. <coughs> so the thresholds I am familiar with are the density thresholds. Well, but the 40R is the density threshold applies basically <coughs> to uh, mixed use. This is a single-use multi-family, right. which is a different set of parameters. No, so we have to allow a density of at least 20 units per acre for multi-family residential use. So anything that's three units or more would be multi-family. So that's the only threshold I'm aware of for this. Okay. At, um, the downtown Smoth Grove District, though, defines a multi-family as four units or more. Mm -hmm. Right. It does. Okay. That's what I was referring to. Okay. And that's um, not one of the waivers we can grant? Right. Okay. Or can we? I think you can grant a waiver for anything but the affordability component. And density. Minimum density. Right. So. Three units max meet the minimum density. Four units. Three units is what we need. Well, we're, sorry. We're three Again, units. we're yeah. throwing out ideas without having explored them all to give right. you options. I just think it's too crowded. The idea that I was thinking of is is three kind of units, but one of them is like two stacked apartments on each other. Is that so? You've got one that's the full townhouse and one that's two units. Is that if if you have to do yeah. four? So you have two larger ones and two smaller ones with one entrance, you know, Somerville style, basically. If you have to hit four. Yeah. Yeah, you could. There are ways to do it, I guess. That would just, and it could, so that would reduce, and spread it out. And but if you could do three units, then you could get to the type of unit you wanted, which is probably a three bedroom, at about that square footage, probably, about, and it would give you. 2,000 square feet to play with to make it work. Oh, one of the units are 37 feet? Yeah. About? Deep, yeah. Um, other comments or questions? So I would just like to comment that under the statute, which is not the same as our zoning. The statute, the 40 r statute, defines multifamily residential as three units or more. So our zoning says four. So we have to use our zoning, but so you know. We'll, we'll, we'll do our research. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, questions? <coughs> comments? I, I'm sorry, did they say that they were going to come back with different plans or? My question, my Can I have question your name? Be, Sorry. Could uh, you Brian Driscoll. I live at 7 Ottawa Terrace. Uh, my question would be, um, if they're putting four units in there, three or more stories, um, who's going to rent this, this piece of property? Definitely not going to be elderly. They're not going to move up that many stairs. And if it's a middle-class family, they're going to have their grandchildren over, grandchildren over there. They're going to need more parking all. I just cannot see putting four units in that piece of tiny property. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, Will Finch, uh, my mill chief. Um, I like the conversation that you're having right now, and you're looking at some options. I'm a little puzzled why this kind of discussion didn't play, take place last time, and that you didn't give the developer a little more input. Um, because it just seemed like very little got accomplished at the last meeting. Um, I think the developer could have used some more guidance. Um, and so what I, I think I'm hearing is that a waiver could be granted for a three-unit parcel. We, we are not sure. We need to look into the details. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, it sounds like that would also give the developer some uh, flexibility. Um, but I'm also puzzled to why the developer came back with the same building um, design, just moved it over a little bit. Um, but they did, I mean, the public did give a lot of 
in, input on the fact that it was just too too big a building, too much, too many units. Um, so I, I think I kind of share your feelings that um, it's just um, they're limited by the, the shape of the lot and the, and the parking issues. Um, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Kim Honich, Slogger, 51 Mill Street. At the previous, the, for the opening of this hearing, we were talking about the applicant asking for a, a density, a waiver, so they could have higher density, with the understanding that the underlying density was two point something units. And now we seem to have switched it and said they have to have higher density. So uh, I, don't, I don't understand what happened between <coughs> this meeting and now, and I definitely appreciate some clarity on the regulation. Sure, that's a good, that's a good question. So, um, so, the um, downtown smart growth district requires um, re requires 20 units per acre. Uh, no, no, it requires no, right. it required. requires 20 units per acre. Period. Um, and we can't um, by Mass by Massachusetts law we can't grant a waiver. Um, it, um, to have them have less than 20 units per acre and still use this this zoning portion of the zoning code, we can provide it a waiver. It, and we, the whole zoning is set up because um, it, so that generally when someone comes in with 40 in a 40 yard district, they are always going to to ask for a waiver because you know how, how can you um, you know the min the minimum and the maximum are the same. 20 units per acre, what's the likelihood of that really happening? So if it was 20.1 acre, we would have to grant a waiver. Basically, any time someone comes in, um, we need to, to, they need to ask us for a waiver. Um, that gives us the ability to not grant them a waiver, and therefore the, the, um, the project is, um, is rejected. So that's really the, that's the, um, that's that's one part, which is the the density. There's also this um, this zoning code is um, allowed for um, it, it, not single family, not um, two family, but some multifamily and above. And our zoning um, uh, uh, that minimum um, that minimum um, unit size is is four units. Per, per acre, um, I mean four units, period, four unit development. The state would have allowed us to go no, down in. No, I misspoke, in, I misread no. it. It says more than three. Okay, Not yeah. three or more. So, the, yeah, so the state, so the state requires the zoning to be used on four units or more. So um, that answers that question is no matter what. In order for them to use this type of zoning, they would have to build four units. It would have been helpful if we had that discussion at the last meeting. I've been trying to follow along and participate, but it was my understanding just the opposite, that they were allowed two units and they were asking for a waiver for greater density. Um, so thank you for explaining right. that. And learning but, on the job, kids. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's a lot to zoning and all these different, um, yeah. And like everywhere else in zoning, three or more is multifamily. Right. So. I've seen it a little different ways in different Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But Ms. May, um, in between um, the last meeting and this one, uh, part of the reason why we did delay was we did try to have a little outreach. Um, the owner did send out a couple of letters to invite uh, public comment to try to help inform some of the plans. So we um, didn't hear any feedback. So what we did was um, use the uh, feedback we got from the hearing and some of the, the, the DRT staff meeting that we had um, and where we kind of settled in on the solution we have. Um, and then in regards to, you know, density versus some of the other um, projects that are also been, you know, approved in the, in the 40R or less than two and a half times um, the density of some of these other projects. I don't know if you want to read off numbers, but we felt like we were, in a, you know, not shooting for the moon, if you will, to try to, you know, on a reasonable number. Sure, and the yeah. applicant after you is going to make the same statement actually that, that the densities have been granted for other projects. And I'll tell you the same thing I'm going to tell them. I don't care because <laughs> I'm looking at your specific project sure. yeah. and I'm allowed to. 
Well, I, I, I think this is serving the purpose of this, uh, the public hearing process, and this kind of zoning is creative zoning, and I think it takes give and take. And I give given us what I think are really valuable uh, ideas tonight, that we'll often see what Donnie can do. Uh, yes, to, and to, to your point, sir, is um, we try not to design their projects. Um, you know, if I designed every project in town, they all look the same, and that would be very boring. We rely on other architects to come up with good ideas. Not sure of that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, Jill Mayberry, resident of Butter. Um, a lot of the concerns are the same as last time. I'm just going to very briefly summarize those with a few more points. Um, a lot of the concerns have already been brought up by you. And um, so I'll just be, I'll just be quick. Um, number one, we appreciate and accept the changes that were um, made in the new plan. Um, we still oppose a four unit structure. Um, we find it palatable to have a two unit structure which would um, seem more uh, appropriate for this size and would help out with the parking. Um, number two, we continue to be um, concerned about the extra traffic on such a narrow street, um, 28 feet wide, and then with a parked car, 15 feet on one side parking on Chapin Avenue. Um, of course, we continue to be um, concerned about the eight parking spaces for the number of bedrooms. and. Um, the bonus room that could easily be split, and um, and the objective of this is to house singles, retirees, and commuters. But as was stated before, I don't see um, a single person needing such a large unit. And then, of course, a retiree, four floors and four staircases, um, which only supports that it's going to bring in multiple residents, and then we have the parking problem. Um, with the 17 and a half feet, it still doesn't give a lot of room um, for backing out, and it doesn't allow for two-way traffic. And that fourth unit in the back, it sounds like we're going to have a revised plan now, it'll be much different, um, it doesn't give much room for turnaround with the um, if the snow storage spot was occupied with snow. And so that's a dual turnaround in a snow storage area. <coughs> um, so we don't have a plan right now, but the original plan, we didn't have a um, plan for drainage for the slope of the driveway to, uh, to accommodate large amounts of snow melt. And um, we were also a little concerned about the snow storage area with the snow toppling over into the abutter next door. And we did request a bond be put in place to save the damage of the trees. I'm in, I'm in consultation with my arborist that I use for my trees. And um, we're waiting for a building plan before he can give me some personal consulting for that. But he, he did recommend that a visible damage is only seen in trees after seven growing seasons. Um, we have um, concerns about the garages. There is no drainage stated for the HVAC in the garages. Um, we're concerned about who's going to oversee all the special maintenance of the porous driveway. There's, um, there's quite a bit of maintenance spelt out in, in the drainage report. Um, some new concerns are that we're concerned about where all the construction vehicles are going to go during construction, and we are um, requesting that construction hours on Saturday be moved up to 9 a.m. rather than the 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. daily work hours. And um, lastly, um, the resident of Butter would like to uh, request a wooden fence instead of a vinyl one, um, eight feet ascending. Um, much like the design that's already in place, and for 29 years, a wooden fence has has been maintained and worked quite well. So there was going to put in a uh, vinyl a vinyl fence, I like a wooden one because it looks more natural. It wears, and that's it. Thank you.
Uh, some of that we usually let the butters work out, right? Um, yeah. We'll talk about that in the decision. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, like the fence, they can work it out between them. Um, Calarizos has a <coughs> final fence that is a wood color. So you may want to go look at that. Mm -hmm. on the South Street side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the name? Calarizos. Calarizos on South and oh, Main. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm only throwing that out there because I like wooden fences too, but they are maintenance. And, you know, you're worried about your trees. Your trees probably mm -hmm. outlast that fence. If it's wooden, so just as an option, you know, they wouldn't have to worry about it getting stained and broken down. But mm -hmm. I don't really care as long as the fence is exactly as we end up deciding it. It's um, height and configuration. Uh, you had a question, sir? Yeah, yeah. can use uh, 28 shape for that. Uh, just one thing about his his parking garages, uh, where they expect to put two vehicles. I mean, I, I have a garage. I do not park my vehicle in it. I use it for storage. If any one of those you want to choose a garage for storage, you're going to put two cars in that driveway. If two of them do it, you're going to put four. Then what happens? Well, I think their condo documents would have to discuss who can and can't park in those in the driveway if they're given two spaces. So uh, it's a different living arrangement, I think, than perhaps we people who live in single-family homes are accustomed to. Um, other comments? Okay. Uh, just getting back to your one comment about um, who maintains the, the porous pavement, if that's eventually approved. Uh, the condo documents have maintenance agreements, and um, they have to send something to the town engineer, I think, yearly, annually, right, to show that they've maintained it. Mm -hmm. He did have a lot of comments about that car statement, though. Yeah. yeah. He being the town engineer. Town engineer, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even the plow isn't allowed to touch the surface. It has to be raised. So, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of restrictions. Yeah. As you correct, Mr. Chairman, as you know, that uh, <coughs> normally would expect to have, if, if approval is granted, a statement that the condominium documents have to contain those kind of restrictions and the uh, maintenance of the purpose pavement and that perhaps the condominium documents have to be approved by the town planner to make sure we've incorporated those conditions. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Double blind working on the road running. Uh, if I recall, the plan shows that Chapman Avenue was 30 feet wide. Uh, it's been measured. It's not 30 feet wide. And when you park an automobile on one side, it's even narrower. Right. Measured by home. So if anybody parks on the northbound side of Chapman, one of the units to right away. I think the difference you're seeing is the, the right of way dimension goes beyond the limits of the physical road. So it goes up over the sidewalk yes. and the tree one? Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Right. Okay. Mm. Okay. So it's 18 feet. Um, I measured it. It's 20, 24. Sure, but you're measuring curb to curb as opposed to what's called the right of way, and that's what the engineering drawings measure so that they can maintain certain data. <coughs> okay, no other comments? Questions? Got some more to do? Guys, can I have one of the parking? Like, what you would like for, like, per unit? <coughs> like, is it two per unit of okay number? I'm just kind of thinking about ways to solve the, the problem. It wouldn't certainly be, like if it was two tandem plus the two visitor and that kind of diagram we're kind of talking about. Or mm -hmm. I think Brad was asking, could we replace kind of two of the tandem garages, if you will, with, with some surface spaces mm -hmm. as part of the solution to stay with that same ratio? Mm -hmm. 
I think it all comes back to your what your <coughs> uh, your market is for what you think these units right. would sell for. Uh, you know, that's a weaselly answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I recognize that, but it's right. The it's the requirement is is 1.25 right, for for this. Um, in you know in a in a which works really well in a bigger development because you know you, you've got that flexibility in a four unit development I don't think 1.25 works and you have to decide does two, does two work um, but what what I think you'll hear from this board is no matter what it is that you have for a, you know um, how you you divide up those those spaces um, among the units, you're also going to, we're going to insist on visitor spaces as well because it happens. I mean, yeah, you, you, need, you need yeah. that. So, um, looks like it to me like it's two plus one. From what you're showing on that plan, that's what you'd need. Okay. I think. Thanks. So, so the question okay. is do you want to come back on the 8th? Um, Schedule this at nine or on January twenty second, and this could be scheduled at eight thirty. Should we come earlier? It's early later. If you want to wait till February, you could be first. If it's Julie, if it's the if it's the ninth, when would we need when would you need information? The eighth. Yeah. Um, a couple weeks before. Yeah, so it's getting close to Christmas. Yeah. How's your schedule over the holidays? Yeah. 22nd? Yeah. Right. Um, Twenty second at eight eight thirty. Okay. Move that the CPDC uh, continue the public hearing for the uh, 40-yard development at 14 Chapin Avenue until January 22nd, 2018 at 8.30 p.m. Yeah. So second. Second. All in favor? Okay. Thank you for your time. Won't that's be good. noticed again, so that's the date. Right. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you. That's right. So each unit is two parking spots and one visitor. So well, I don't know. I mean, you can two and then one. So that one. How many? You know, we have four, six, seven, eight about to start. Right? Okay. Okay. And then as an they never can, well, those are people that don't come in and talk to me. Oh, every meeting. Oh, this is our recourse. We stop work in order. Correct. Yeah. Does that work? I'm just visitors. Yeah. I'm unclear. And then I notified everyone who was there because I was like, here, have it out. Big developer. Yeah. Yeah. So that we, it's one of the things that we get Thank you. You might get eight feet, or you might get eight feet on one inch, or you might get 12. Like, well, that's yeah. such a way of it. It's a lot of stress. <laughs> I mean, that's what I was just looking at now. We don't have anything now. Yeah. Um, they're, already, they're already engineering that driveway to try and pick up. All right. Hey, how are you? Um, 
Cubs. Yeah. Cubs. Yeah. Cubs. Yeah. It matches the show. Oh, okay. The house across um, the street from me. I mean, it probably alive. can't hurt, right? Yeah, well, it's fine. Yeah. yeah, I'll pass them around. Okay. And then you took everything. You need tons of uh, I did, yeah. Like no, seven. Maybe. I think it was maybe a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so I have it. Okay. Until you're going to take a five minute break. Okay. Now you guys get to wait another five minutes. You're like, all right. Okay. So after the snow go, can I stop that? You're going to stick around? I'll stay for this. Totally. Okay. Yeah. I just, All right. No, but yeah. I just, if, if we hit the, like, loving zone again. Yeah, I know. It's hard when we have just one meeting a month and there's so many Yeah, no, I hear you. Hard. Thank you. It doesn't like to stay on me. Because... <laughs> <laughs> This is new, mm -hmm. different. It's going to be the same as the presentation. It's not Virginia building. Well, it was like this. Yeah. Meetings till midnight, and you can only expect volunteers to do so much. I'm not, the, what, again, not a criticism, just I a, know, a no, statement. Yeah. These aren't substantially different. They just have like a rendering included, yeah. right? Okay. So the I think the meat and potatoes is not that is not different. It's that there's a couple um, illustrative drawings okay. added in. So. Okay, so the I would not accept changes, right? changes to meat yeah. and potatoes at the hearing. Unless there are suggestions that come from you. <laughs> okay. So the, the application form is unchanged what I'm hearing, but the tabloid material is different. That's what it sounds like. I So next up here is this um, public hearing for 40-yard plan review for 67 Main Street, the form of Sunoco property. Mm -hmm. oh, the public hearing. Uh, notice is hereby given that under Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 11, and Section 10.5.11.2, Three of the Reading Zoning Bylaw, the Community Planning and Development Commission will hold a public hearing on Monday, December 11th, 2017 at 8.30 p.m. 
in the Selectman's meeting room at Reading Town Hall, 16 Lowell Street, to consider an application for plan approval under Mass General Law 40R submitted by, uh, how do you pronounce? Bogus. Bogus uh, Properties, LLC, for property located at 467 Main Street, Assessor's Map 17, Lot 61. A copy of the application and associated plans are available to the public in the Public Services Office in Town Hall, Monday through Thursday, 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., and Tuesdays, 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m., and on the town website the Thursday prior to the meeting date. Thanks. Julie, anything you want to say before? I think let's just let them jump right in since it's okay. already so late. Great. If I may, Mr. Chair. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Commission, uh, for the record, my name is Brian McGrail. I'm an attorney uh, from Wakefield. Office is at 599 North Avenue, just over the running line in Wakefield. Uh, here on behalf of the applicant, Bogus Properties, LLC, uh, with me tonight, part of our team, is this is Ray Bogus, who is the principal and manager of the entity. Uh, also here tonight is Rob Del Savio, uh, who is uh, with Embark, Embark Studio Architecture and Design on the architectural team. With him is Sarah Reinhardt, also with Embark Studio Architecture and Design. Uh, Dave Giancrandi is here. Dave is uh, PE, our PE Site Civil. He's the president of Design Consultants, Inc. And also uh, Tom Bertulis with Design Consultants, Inc. also, who will talk about other components of the, of the civil, such as traffic. Uh, we're, we're here before your commission tonight seeking approval on the section 10.5 of the zoning bylaws of the town of Reading and Mass General Laws Chapter 40R, looking to construct a four-story mixed-use building with 30 housing units and approximately 2,560 square feet of commercial space at the property known and numbered as 467 Main Street in Reading. It's shown as Assessor's Map 17, Lot 61. Um, I do want to point out that eight of the proposed residential units would be designated as affordable units, hopefully with a local preference uh, for those who qualify as such in the town of Reading. The property is located within the business zoning district and also within the downtown smart growth <coughs> district, 40 our overlay district. The property is comprised of approximately 18,063 square feet of land <coughs> currently has a one-story commercial building that is home to a retail gas station known as Sunoco in the town of Reading and also an automobile repair business. Uh, my client and our team have met with town officials, members of the planning staff on more than one occasion to obtain their input and specific desires related to this property which we believe are reflected in the application and plans that have been submitted to the Commission. I also want to point out that we've had the opportunity to have a neighborhood meeting on site uh, with neighbors to explain the project right at the property and to answer uh, questions and any concerns that uh, folks in the neighborhood had. Um, as was noted uh, before the meeting, um, what you will see tonight may slightly vary uh, from the submittal materials. Um, in an effort to react and adjust to input and comments that we have received since filing uh, from the planning staff uh, at Town Hall. We are excited to bring the pro this project to Reading. We believe that it will fit very nicely into the downtown smart growth district, uh, a district that was implemented to attract projects of this nature. Uh, not only will this project revitalize a somewhat rundown property, but it will also change the use of that property to what we believe is in a positive manner and bring residents close to downtown while also increasing the tax base uh, to the town of Reading. Um, with that said, Mr. Chair, I'm going to hand it over to my client, uh, Ray Bogus, who would like to address the commission if he may, and then we're going to go right to our team and present uh, the project as submitted, if we may. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Thank you for everyone for being here. Uh, I just want to take a minute to um, do an overview of how we approach this development. And uh, before I hand over to Rob, uh, when we set out to design our project six months ago, we decided to take a proactive approach and address uh, many concerns up front. 
uh, we set out to do our homework um, by reading the town meetings from previous 40 yard developments projects. We invited feedback from the town staff and as well as the butters for the project. As a team, we saw many concerns from the community and town, and decided to tweak our plans to address these concerns up front. Some of these examples are we pulled our property away from um, our back property line where it bus residents uh, residents. We stepped the back portion of our one of our the back portion of our building on floors two and three away from our uh, residents in the back there. We moved all of our balconies from the rear and the side of our property. We reduced our uh, unit count by 12 percent. We moved our parking entrance off of Main Street onto Green Street where we are proposing to put a safety light to indicate when cars are exiting. We added a retail space along Main Street to create a more prominent downtown presence. We eliminated all three bedroom units to lessen the concern about additional uh, students in the uh, school systems. We raised our park and garage ceiling height to allow for resident move-ins and move-outs to take place in the garage rather than on the street. Um, and as a team, we feel like we've taken a proactive approach and has helped us design a better building that will hopefully have a positive impact on the town of Reading. Um, however, we do invite all questions and comments at the end of the presentation. Thank you. And I'll hand over to Rob now. I'm Rob Del Savio from Embark Studio. I'll take you through some of the, the images of the building now. Just to orient everybody, uh, Main Street is here. The site on the, on the site of the existing gas station is here, and it abuts the corner of Green Street. These are some scroll up a little bit. A few aerial uh, street foot level photos. This is the site right here. It stretches from about here up to the intersection with Green Street. Um, this view is looking down Green Street with the property on your right. You can see that the sidewalks are fairly improved along here. The brick paving, the brick crosswalks are intact. And there are two street lights and two trees along here, which we'll talk a little bit about how we're going to be uh, doing some work to that and restoring it. Right now, there's a fair amount of curb cut along um, Main Street getting access to the gas station, which with our current plan, we'll be closing all that up and just having a continuous curb line. So this is the ground floor plan, again, Main Street at the bottom, Green Street up here. Uh, the majority of the ground floor uh, habitable space is retail, spanning almost three quarters of the length of Main Street. That's about 2,500 square feet of retail. It's a small residential component, which is, provides access to the residents here, elevator and so forth. Um, access to the parking garage, which is at grade but covered by the building, is off of Green Street. There's two-way access in off of Green Street. And the area that's sort of the shaded in this yellowish color represents the building over your head. So it's sort of podium construction, as we call it. There are 37 parking spaces with 15 compact and 22 standard spaces. Basically, the flow of the traffic, for the most part, we've been able to create this loop to get out. That will also allow a moving truck of certain sizes, at least, to not have to back out onto Green Street earlier on. In one of the initial meetings we have with uh, Julie and her team, we're concerned about that truck having to back out when it leaves, even though it's not terribly frequent. Um, so um, we've maintained the rear yard setback. This is a residential zone here. Here, This is actually a commercial zone, although there's a residential uh, use on it right now. So that's a 15-foot setback, which we've meant to maintain with the building overhead. Uh, if you can go to the next one. This is how a typical upper floor... Sorry. Okay. so finicky. <laughs> I don't know. I think we should talk more about this one. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's try that. So this is a typical upper floor plan. Again, we've maintained on the second floor of the building now the 15-foot setback. We'll see how that changes as we go up. It's a double-loaded corridor building. There are a total of 30 uh, apartments in the project. But right now, the mix is 22 bedrooms and 10 one-bedrooms for a total of 30. Why is it open in Explorer as opposed to, say, a PDF viewer or something? I have no idea. I, this isn't. A, I'm not familiar with how to use this like specific angle technology. New thing. <laughs> I know, I'm, like, I'm such a dinosaur. <laughs> the Windows 10 op um, default. You have to actually go in and uh, tell it to use okay. Adobe Acrobat when viewing PDFs. And this is computer is the one that's usually in the conference room, so I'm just like whatever. <laughs> So much for Microsoft again. <laughs> so this is the fourth floor 
plan of the building now. Now we'll see our step back uh, off of uh, Main Street, uh, back the full five feet for this whole run. We have, in addition to residential units on this level, there's this green zone here, sort of amenity space, clubhouse space, interior space. And then on the rear of the building, which we'll see in section in a minute, we follow the prescriptive requirements that there's a 63 and a half degree slope angle setback from the rear residential lot back here, which is why this building is now set back about 23 and a half feet or so from the rear property line. Next one. Next one. So this is the roof plan, um, mechanical system that's up on the roof includes a, a rooftop unit that's about four and a half feet tall or so, and then a series of condensing units, each one is assigned to one of the apartments, those are in the three and a half foot range. There's a roof deck here for residents, access which is provided by way of the elevator, and then there's two egress stairs to get people off of that, uh, that roof deck. Again, the roof deck is predominantly pushed towards Main Street, and all the equipment is shielded with a screen from the abutters to the rear of the building, um, about a four and a half foot tall fence, a screen wall. What do you anticipate the large unit for? Car to make up there. It, it may only be two thirds of that size, but it's about there. Very large. So these are two sections through the building. In this case, this is main, the Main Street side on, on this elevator on this section. Here we see the required five-foot setback happening at the second floor of the building. And then what happens in the distance, we'll see this in elevation in a moment, is that where the bays pop out, that setback occurs at the fourth floor level. So from what we've understood from the, uh, the planning, the zoning code is that either setback is allowed. So rather than having just a continuous line, we thought it would give more scale to change where the setback occurs. On the rear property lines, the piece that abuts the residential uh, butter to the rear, this is that angle of um, that we need to keep the building mass out of. So we're stepping back quite a bit at that third floor level line. Next one. These are the elevations as they, as they currently are right now. This is the elevation along Main Street. What's rendered in this sort of their color is in fact brick. We can talk about where we got some of that inspiration from in a minute. Each of these are uh, access to their retail pods of the building. It could be one whole retailer, it could be three. I'm not quite sure yet where the, the marketing and leasing is going, but we've got good opportunities. We think the rhythm of the three helps to break down a 175 foot long building pretty well. And then the feature piece at the end is really the residential entrance, and that's the, this, tab, this piece here. Uh, again, the building is now stepped back, this, so this whole plane is back five feet from the, the, the brick plane. The ground floor at the corner, looking up Main Street, has predominantly storefront glazing to foster use, and we've been hoping that a, some user, a restaurant user or cafe, we can have some dining tables outside. Um, the view at the bottom is of Green Street. This is the corner looking up the hill towards Main Street. This is the garage door that we looked at giving access to vehicles coming in and turning in off uh, uh, Green Street. Okay. And this is some of the uh, some of the inspiration that we took. Um, it's from the Charles Building. We some of the brick coloration, some of the detailing, not actually terribly literal about it, but. We think it's a great building. The windows are great size. Where portions of windows are brick are good. So, this is sort of an exploded view of what our typical three bay piece looks like. We've got a precast base. Again, the reddish color is the brick. Some brick detailing over the awning and up at the top. And then all that is capped off with the precast the stone cap. Uh, and then the storefront entrance is down there. So, it's not exactly a replica of that, but we wanted to take some of the pieces that we thought were nice about that building, including the brick color itself as a material and try to weave that into um, the design of the building. The next slide shows the rear elevations of the building. Um, this is the, the facade that faces the muffler shop. So the muffler shop is basically here in this view right now. And then this is facing the rear property line. So just to orient everybody again, again, this is the view up Main Street. The site is here. The next one. And this is the 3D rendering of the building in place. Again, the residential entrance is here. 
distinguished by some further articulation of material choices for the second and third floors, and then the three bays with the re uh, retail entrances here, and the top floor and fourth floor set back from the, uh, from the main mass of the building. And then we did this view earlier today. It's sort of a, this was not included in the earlier package, but it's sort of a photo montage of the building as seen from up higher on Main Street, looking back down towards the site. This is the building here. Um, given the, the increased elevation grade that you picked up by coming up Main Street, that doesn't appear as tall as it, as it would be. But this is a sort of a good picture of the building. We're trying to get a little bit more brick here to tie into some of the brick that happens as you sort of head down Main Street in that direction. I'll turn it over to Dave and his team now to walk through some of the civil engineering issues. Good evening, I'm David G. Grande. I'm a professional engineer here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and a principal at Design Consultants. Um, I'll, uh, I'll run through the, the civil portion of the site, um, specifically um, water, sewer, electric, telephone, and uh, drainage. Um, currently, the site does grade out from the existing building towards Main Street. And um, in the future, what, we, we, what we've got is a, an area of the building um, that covers the parking lot. So anything <coughs> inside the building will be collected um, in a drainage system with catch basins and then brought to a uh, oil gas separator and then out to the sewer. Now that's it, the area covered by the building. The building itself will have roof drains that will be delivered to an infiltration system where we'll allow the, the water to um, penetrate back into, uh, into the uh, aquifer, essentially an aquifer recharge system or infiltration system. Uh, the, the portion of the parking lot that extends out beyond the building will be collected in a uh, catch basin, go through a particle separator, and then into the infiltration system. Um, as a result of the infiltration system and the fact that most of the existing site is paved, almost the entire site, for all storms, uh, 5, 10, 20, uh, 25, uh, 50, and 100, uh, we will be reducing uh, the, the uh, rate of runoff for all of the site and as well as the, the volume of runoff. Now, how we achieve this is we sort of have a break line in line with these columns. So anything, any of the water that, that falls on the asphalt uh, will run down and run in this direction towards this catch basin. Anything in here that is, say, snow melt or uh, just drippings from the cars will be collected in these catch basins and then out to Main Street. Um, so that goes to the sewer line. This goes to the drain line. Uh, other utilities, water will come in off of Green Street is what we're projecting right now, both domestic and fire, and then communications also off of Green Street. We've selected this location for the transformer pad. And we had some preliminary uh, discussions with Reading Municipal Light with respect to that. Um, can you go to the next slide, Julie, please? And this just, um, this, this shows, again, just some of the dimensions, as uh, Rob had alluded. We've got two-way travel <coughs> here. Vehicles can get by if there is a, a truck loading, say, for move-in or, or something like that. Vehicles can still get by. And then we have a one-way circulation in this general area. Um, one other thing I did want to mention from a civil perspective, we do so show um, two on-street parking locations here. Um, we potentially can achieve uh, additional parking spaces in this, lo in this location. What it would mean is that we would have to relocate one of the um, one of the street lights and we would have to um, remove one of the trees but we would then replace that tree obviously to facilitate uh, the on-street parking. I think that in many, many conditions, on-street parking sort of is the identifier of that you're approaching the downtown. So um, it, it, 
it, uh, in this particular case, the state highway layout ends at the train tracks. Typically in our downtowns, they're municipally owned yet state route numbered. So we're still allowed to park in the, in the downtown areas. Out where it's state owned, you'll not, you don't see parking spots. So this sort of identifies the, 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 the start of the, the real CBD in the downtown. Um, and what we were able to do was move this out. So there is still su a substantial sidewalk here. This is at its narrowest point. It's still seven feet within the right of way. Um, plus there's a little bit of additional room beyond the, uh, the right of way because the, the, the um, sidewalk would go all the way up to the building. Uh, I think that that's what I wanted to cover. I think that the parking spaces were already covered, 30, uh, 37 spaces. So um, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Tom Batulis, who is a uh, professional traffic operations engineer that works for design consultants as well. Greetings, good evening. I was here just a few weeks ago, so I see lots of familiar faces. A different project, I'm Tom Bertulis, traffic engineer. That's my boss, Dave. So I pay him to say good things about me, so I um, appreciate that. We are, um, so for this intersection, this is, I followed a very similar format to my last project on Google Street. So we went out there, we followed all the MassDOT guidelines for this traffic study. We looked at existing conditions, we did hourly, peak hour turning movement counts at these three intersections. We, we, we did 48 hour tube counts right along Main Street. The three intersections are of course are Main at Green, Main at Washington, and Green at Elliott over here. We went out and looked at existing conditions to try to assess the site before we then went on and did the actual chip generation and building the traffic model. So we can go to the next slide. This is a very quick presentation, by the way, so I only have uh, this slide basically is basically it. So we looked, we generated the trips, um, and, I, and I do want to notice. Uh, note that we did not take credit for the gas station, which we could have, but we tried to be as conservative as possible. We did, we wanted, every case we were very conservative when we built this model. So we didn't take credit for the gas station. Um, we, we did take credit for the current auto repair shop. What we did was actually did empirical counts. We went out there and counted how many trips in the AM peak hour is three trips, and the PM peak hour is four trips, as we can see here, and we took credit for that. For the combined residential and retail, we found it was 36 AM trips and 34 PM trips um, adjusted. Now, we did not take any credit for transit. I was actually talking to the town. They said, just assume 100% vehicle trips, even though there's 83% vehicle trips. We wanted to be as conservative as possible in every way. We also were conservative with our annual growth rate. We chose 1%, which is much higher than the Metropolitan Planning Organization had in the model for this. We didn't reduce for seasonal adjustment, even though we took our counts in October. We were 8% higher than the annual average. So all these are different ways that we are as conservative as possible when we, when we built the model. And we did, by the way, find there was no significant traffic impact on this model. So that's basically the bottom line. There's no, no significant traffic impact. The net vehicle trips of 30 and 33 trips during the peak hour. By the way, this is just during one hour. I've had questions in the past. They said, that's rush hour? Are you know, four hours? No, that, it could be that much every hour. Um, now, if you average that, it's about a trip every two minutes on average to sort of get a visceral idea of how much traffic is going to be generated by this project. So if you think two minutes goes by, car comes out. Another two minutes goes by, car comes out. So sort of, you get a sort of sense that 
this project is not going to have a tremendous impact traffic wise on the, on the transportation network. So I think I covered everything. Uh, that's my presentation. There's time for questions afterwards. I'm happy to answer questions. There's usually one or two traffic questions. I don't know if we should wait till after. Or, um, or we answer now, or what do you guys think? Well, I think I think that that's our presentation, Mr. Chair. Um, we're happy to obviously our whole team uh, to answer questions that uh, you would bring the staff might have. Uh, obviously, entertain your comments. Okay. Thank you. Comments from the board. Want to start? Uh, if I can just start with traffic since yeah. we ended there. Sure. Um, before you go running off, um, uh, I guess looking through the traffic report. You know, I, I'm not sure it's going to make a tremendous difference in the total um, in the total impact. But I did notice that um, most of your your well, your split of where cars are going to from and to um, uh, just didn't. I'm going to say feel right to me with a hot, pretty high percentage headed out Green Street. Um, and which I don't, I don't think that's really the way that, that that it would happen here. I think most people would be destined to um, to Main Street. Um, maybe others would think differently. Um, but I guess what the the concern that I have with that is how do um, you know. One every two minutes, right? Um, maybe more. Well, one every two minutes, in the peak hour on that stretch of Main Street, um, <laughs> any turning any any turning vehicle impacts a whole slew of of traffic because it slows down. Um, and I, and I guess that's really my concern here. It's not the the volume, but it's. Um, coming, being generated by the development, it's really all those turning movements in and out of Green Street, which now have really not a whole lot of not a whole lot of um, turning movements. And this, you know, thirty an hour, it, it's you know, it, it's not an insignificant. Um, it's not huge. It's not going to bring the the town to a screeching halt, but um, but it's something definitely worth. Um, knowing and little, understanding a little bit <coughs> about that's my yeah. So what would you want to do? Do you um, want me to just respond in general? Sure, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, so thank you for bringing that up. Uh, <coughs> regarding your first comment about the chip distribution yeah. didn't, didn't feel yeah. right, we basically followed the MassDOT standard guidelines, which says look at the existing chip distribution of where the motor vehicles are currently going and use that as a, as a model for the proposed chip just distribution. Obviously there's going to be nuances, but like you already had a hint at, it wouldn't make a huge difference by right? a, a small percentage shift here or there. The, the guidelines basically say this is, this is what we think is best and if another 5% or 10% go one way or the other, in the big scheme of things, it's not going to make a, a, a big difference. Your second question more had to do with the amount of turns and how much congestion is going to occur. We did run a model on this, and we found no change in level of service. We found no significant impact. So we did look at it very carefully. Um, but it's, yeah, it's great I, that I you guess, bring those up. Yeah. I, I guess I would just note yeah. you had, I think, if memory serves me correct, 45% of the traffic coming out of here turning. To Green Street, so my gut says no. It's really more like, and maybe folks that that live around here could tell me maybe that's right. Uh, my guess is you probably don't have a whole lot of data on, from on Green Street, but my gut says really it's more like 80 percent turn turn onto Main Street and may, maybe 10 the other direction. Um, so that it's not one or two here, but again, it's. Uh, we're not talking about a huge number of cars, but I think the the percentage, from my perspective, is 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 a big difference from what you're suggesting. And I, I don't know if that changes the dynamics of of the the model. Can I just sure? That was my concern as well. I mean, I, 
that left, I call that like a ways left. Mm -hmm. You know, when it roots me that way to mm -hmm. take that left, I don't go that way mm -hmm. because that left off of Green Street is challenging. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I'm very new at understanding these reports, mm -hmm. but I, it was hard for me to factor in, you know, just the challenge of it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, would create some some additional traffic just waiting for people to be able to take a left type of places. I, it's hard for me to see if that was in there as well. Absolutely, and, and people will wait, and there will be that issue of <laughs> just not a significant enough time to degrade it by a level of service. I, well, guess. I, I guess that's where, I, you know, I, I, I get the models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but the reality is, so coming south, you've got a, a, a one, uh, a single lane. Um, and that, I, I don't know what the, the model says, but that lane is in the, in the peak hours is packed from Washington, because Washington Street, that intersection does not work, yeah. right? So um, it is packed from Washington Street um, up to Haven, probably, I don't know, all the way up to, to 129. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Solid solid line of cars during definitely the peak hour, probably the whole peak, peak period close to. So if you have people turning in, to, waiting for the other you know pods of cars coming mm -hmm. through heading north, which definitely you know, <coughs> sometimes that section packs in mm -hmm. as well from from 129 down to, to Washington Street. So you've got people trying to take a left, no one able to go around them. Um, and, and that's really what I'm, what I'm getting at is you, you've got, you're introducing a whole series of, of turning movements in here in a, in a section that doesn't work too well uh, to date. And, um, and and because it's not signalized, it, it may just, it, it will create issues. People would naturally make a right once it becomes too you difficult so, and that don't. area gets stacked. Like, no, if this project's built, like, yeah. and that left-hand turn, like, gets stacked to Main Street and it just gets really hard to get out, people will naturally make a right and go down to get right. to 95 yeah. that way. Yeah. And circle back around. You'd think that, but then you have the Ash Street and the McDonald's as another one where naturally you shouldn't want to take a left, and yet people do. Yeah. I was just yeah. just yeah. thinking about yeah. like. Well, it, it, the other thing, <coughs> bear in mind that the Green Street, uh, that direction, which I guess is is west, is one way. So basically, from Main Street towards the depot, Green Street is one-way, single-lane street. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's coming out of the, the two-way section of Green Street, uh, basically take their life in their hand to get across Main Street in the first place. Mm -hmm. But the only place that they can reasonably go is, is would be heading towards the depot. I mean, so it's the the traffic in this particular area is uh, sensitive and hard to. Um, hard to deal with even as it is. I mean, the most the most successful way to get out of this the proposed development would be to turn east on Green Street and go down and around to to Washington. That's what I'm yeah. saying. That's what I that's what I would do. The, Except Washington's going to back up. To I mean, I guess it depends. Already. But I guess it depends on where you want. Or or you could go to Walkersbrook and jump on. Like if if your goal is to get to 95. You know, you have one way to get there. All right, thank you. So let's give him some direction then. So what more information do you want or what changes do you want to see? Because I don't see any. Well, we, yeah, we want what some more. What more information do you want? You want to see level of service? Isn't that in the report? You want him to change the mix? Say 100% left? See what it does? Yeah. 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 Yeah, because I want to see how sensitive that is to those turns. And if, you know, if the volume's just so small, then it doesn't mean anything, then who cares? Or if, or if it requires a, a no left turn out of Green Street for particular hours of the day. I mean, yeah. yeah. 
or more maybe more problematic is the left turn off of Main Street into Green. Yeah. Because it's a single lane. Because it's a single lane. Yeah. Going heading yeah. south on <coughs> south on Main, taking the left on Green. Okay. So is that enough direction? It is. Yeah. I mean, you you'd mentioned eighty twenty, and you mentioned one hundred percent. So I wasn't curious. I was curious. I'd run it at one hundred percent because the number is pretty small, and it shouldn't. It shouldn't impact level of service, but if it does at one hundred percent, we can say, well, one hundred percent is it, right. One hundred percent is not is not realistic, but if it works at one hundred percent, then there's no so there's basically discussion stops. Stop down on main zero percent. Go left on green. No, 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 no. I'm on the building. Oh. Out westbound <coughs> green left turns. Let's be the building. Because you, you everyone mentioned makes both. Left. Everyone goes everyone left. Makes yeah. left. You mentioned both the, the southbound and this westbound. You mentioned both of those, yeah. but right. you want me to split one or both? Just west. My concern Just west is, is the west green to south. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you want to run, <coughs> yeah. it should tell you what's going to happen with a left-hand turn coming yeah. south yeah. Into, into green. Yeah, and that backs up all the cars that are coming from the center. We're not taking public comment just yet. Hold on. Mm -hmm. I'll get to you first. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's the it's. I think it's well. It's it's both times a day. But in the yeah. in the AM peak, I notice it because I drive down there. But AM peak, it's those well south and it, the left off of Main and PM. It's the other. It's the other way. But it's probably also the reverse. I just don't notice it as much. So let's do the jump. So before you sit down, so I um again because I'm not as familiar with reading these, mm -hmm. can you show me where the retail has been included in the mix of trips for the built scenario? Sure, absolutely. Well, we didn't break it down here, but it's definitely in the report. Yeah, I can I show can. you the page number if you want. Mm -hmm. Um I, I So if you go to page 20, yeah, page 20. So you see table B3, the second table there. Here where it says proposed retail space. That whole table is dedicated to retail. So you're okay with the proposal? Yeah. Um, on traffic, what's the distance between Green Street and the garage door? And how many cars can you stack there? Do you mean Main Street and the garage door? I'm sorry, Main Street and the garage door. I think it's 46 feet. 46 feet. Right. So so you've got to one. the closest point. <clears throat> two. Okay. So you've got two cars that you can stack before anybody trained to take a left out of the parking garage is going to wait. So that, the fact that it's less than 50 feet will require them to get um, approval by the Board of Selectmen. Okay. We've mentioned that to them. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. I have Good. not for traffic. Okay. Sorry. Can I, you mentioned <clears throat> parking spots in the front. Mm -hmm. You said, you know, so you've got two built in here. You said, you know, with the movement of a um, street light and a tree, you could do more. Is that correct? Or no, we, we as to facilitate the two parking spots, we'd have to relocate a street light and, um, and also a, uh, a, a tree and put in new trees. And have you done any consideration of an additional spot? I just we we did. And looking I, at the retail, you, you could have three establishments. Here. Right. So there's a couple of things. If you look at the width of the sidewalk at the K's, Understood. that's one component. Also, there is a transformer, or, or excuse me, a vault, an electric vault out front here. And the reason why we cut it to two was a little bit of a concern for that. I think we we would like to have three, if if um, 
if we can get more data <coughs> on the size of their vault, possibly we could squeeze a, a third in. But that was at least the initial concern. Why don't we, when we write the, the um, decision, we could say up to three spaces. And then that would that let them figure it out. That also needs approval by the Board of Selectmen. Sure. Yeah. Just wanted to say that. Yep. Did, um, who, does Mass not get involved at all in um, use of, of um, so that section of Main Street? Yep. That's ultimately a question for the town engineer, but we do own that portion. Yeah. It's, it's locally owned. So I, yeah. I happen to do quite a bit of uh, mass dot work for municipalities. Uh, we did Route 28 up in Andover th from Phillips through. Mm -hmm. And um, traditionally, changes and modifications to this would be local. Okay, if we were on the other side of the train tracks, on the other side yeah. of McDonald's, yeah. beyond where Saratani's was down that way, <coughs> um, then that would be that would be have to get uh, approval from Mass Dog. Uh, the reason why I ask is, to me, um, that parking spot looks like it's too close to the corner with the ball belt on, a, on I'm going to call it a state highway, understanding it's, you know, it's... it's, it's local control. Yeah, yeah, local control of a state highway. We do not have this same situation anywhere else in town where we have uh, a parking spot, a, a leading, uh, um, a parking spot where you pull um, into the, f to the intersection to back up into the spot. We have it a lot of different ways, but, but not that way. Um, and, uh, and I, I'm just raising that concern um, that whether that's an issue, <clears throat> certainly if MassDOT needs to, to get involved, that would, um, they would. <clears throat> Especially where there's a crosswalk there. So we yeah. want a clearance of about 20 feet. And that might be another, in, in final design, as we look at these type of issues, that might be another reason why those might slide back another yeah. five feet, give yeah. a little bit more space, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, we want to make sure that we're creating a safe crossing environment as well. So. In fact, John, we do have the, the same kind of parking on the other side of Main Street. It's, it's, but it's, mu it's much further back. It's, it's what we call a far side stop. Yeah. So this is a near side, or, or that's a far side parking movement versus a near side parking movement. So the, the John's right. perspective was correct. You need to pull okay. up towards the intersection to and back, back in, in on the near side. On the far side, you pull beyond and then back up. So you're pulling through the intersection and then backing into the space. So a little bit more room might be prudent here. Yep. Other questions? Um, I understand that there's a lot of regulation and so forth involved, but the uh, converting from the gas station with underground storage tanks, the, we've had uh, historically a lot of remediation issues. Uh, <clears throat> What's your uh, give? Give us a, a quick rundown on converting from a gas station to uh, a more ordinary use. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, can, I can touch on that. Um, we've done um, extensive environmental studies on the property. We have an environmental attorney and also our own licensed site professional, mm -hmm. as well as a seller, um, and we're very comfortable that they're won't be any issues. We've done uh, testing, we've done uh, water sampling. We've done okay, but I'm presuming that it will take, basically open up the entire thing and remove all of the uh, the underground storage areas and replace it with clean, appropriately uh, fill and so forth. Correct. We, yes. we had an issue with the uh, former Getty station, which is still a blank spot on Main Street further south. <laughs> Uh, something that we're cautious about. This is done a lot. About seven years ago, um, they were required Sunoco, to replace their single wall tanks with double wall tanks. And at that time, they mediated the site and um, deemed it cleaned, uh, clean. Uh, so it will be a similar process this time around. Uh, okay. It made us feel more comfortable after we did our work as well, knowing that that site was cleaned seven years ago. So, uh, okay, it's a seller's so obligation to remove the tanks. 
So that be we, under we understand, but yeah. <laughs> the tenure is a vested interest. Okay. Um, we'll get a couple of issues here. A couple of questions. Tom. This package certainly softens up the building a bit from what I saw. Um, although it does look like the little sister of the initial Gould Street project. Um, your, your rendering, you know, your watercolor rendering, mm -hmm. that's great. Yeah. But I think that there's some things you'll need to carry over. So, lesson learned from the Haven Street project. Your articulated coping you know that projection on that coping, I think, is going to have to go all the way around. Um, they tried a sort of modernist, sort of knife edge almost, you know, flat, and it just doesn't work. So your, your rear elevations and your side elevations that show this, this very flat coping with no projection like you show on the front, I think, I really think you need to articulate that. Uh, as you have with the, um, the brick structures, you know. I think that's important. Um, you indicate a material called smooth face CMU. That is not acceptable. If you mean ground face or if you mean polished, that's something else. But ground, ground face. smooth face, not acceptable. That's just regular, that's regular CMU. Ground face is what we mean. All right. um, I'm concerned about how you're going to remove snow from those open covered parking spaces. Manually? It's going to be a property management obligation. Sure, but what are they going to do? Are they going to do it with a snowblower and a shovel, or are you going to try and get a plow down there? Where's the snow going to go? It's about 2,500, 3,000 square feet. I know, but it's got to go somewhere. It's going to be removed off site if it's too big and there's two back portions of the site that are wide open in between the parking spaces. It would be, uh, you need a significant storm, and then they would have to obligate it to take it off site. Yeah, but just pushing it off onto your project pro property manager isn't isn't the answer that we need. Want a snow we need management yeah, we need to really figure out. Okay, how are you going to do? How is that going to do it? Because, <coughs> right, you, you're. You, I, I get you need to. You've got some work on parking, I think. Still, um, you're 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 not at 1.25. Um, yeah, you, you still got to find another space, um, and. Um, um, and I and I think we also want to talk about the percentage of compact spaces. Yeah, it's like um, forty percent. That's yeah. way too high. Um, so I think there's still a little bit a little bit of work that you've got on here. But certainly, you know, if, if the the plan is, um, I, I, you got to have a you know, if those spaces get all covered up with with snow and they're not usable, then the, then you, you got any, you, you have even further. Um, further spaces. Um, so that's something that you, you you definitely need to come up with a plan on how that would be dealt with. Um, I have some more stuff on the architecture. You mentioned that you took away all of the balconies because you heard what happened with the 24 hoops. That was a really, that was a very specific residential condition, you know, existing abutting residential condition. And I would say that other than the the, pro the property to your um, immediately, what is that, southeast, the Johnson <coughs> property, I don't know that you have any residential abutters that are that close. Uh, you could certainly have balconies on the south elevation, which is right now facing 128 tire. Um, you might be able to have some on the um, recessed portion, the center portion. I mean, we, we would like to include them. One of nice. the things that, that I was disappointed with, but I understood the concern of the abutters, is that we were taking away these amenities that make these apartments attractive. And we want them to be sellable. You know, you, you want something more than just a brick box. But we had other concerns there that I don't think exist here necessarily. So you might want to look at adding some of these features to the building. Um, certainly on the south, um, again, I think it's just your southwest face, which is closest to the residential harbor. So you, you probably wouldn't do anything there. Yeah, that guy. Oh. Go back to the, the southeast. We'd, uh, we'd love to add those. I think those would be a nice amenity for the residents. 
outdoor space is important. So, so it's the back. Okay. Back. Right anyway. <laughs> Scroll down. <coughs> oh, did I not help you? No. Ah, uh, where is it? The Green Street side. <laughs> Right there. Okay, so so this bottom elevation is facing a commercial property. That here, I think you could have some there. The top left elevation, that's the one immediately abutting the the residential, the, the house and its um, accessory structure. So that wouldn't put any there, but maybe that back piece in the center. Well, I think that the inside there's a good reset, a good distance of right. setback yeah. here. You could do it on that side. So that yeah, you could. So you can look at those. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, we weren't opposed to them. We were just we were addressing an issue with a specific project. And then, if you look at that same elevation there, and then even in the front, I think you should do something to that top story. And I don't know. I think it's a color change, probably. You don't have to recess it because you've done enough of that with, with how you've articulated the front. But if you look at the front elevation too. Especially if you're going to continue with this idea that you want to uh, waver on the height. I think if that top story were a slightly darker color than the rest of the siding that you're putting up in that plane, it would appear to break up more. And you mentioned you were going to probably try to get more brick on this north elevation. I think this this projecting bay here at the bottom is a good opportunity to mm -hmm. just continue that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had we had the <coughs> box and I looked at it that way, but we agree. You know, from a that's practical point of view, um, you show a uh, basically remote controlled door on the garage. Um, and that's a, a timing constraint getting in and out of the building. Uh, are you sure that that's something that you A, need, or B, want? We want the door from a security perspective to, to some degree. And I think with the train, you know, you're not going to rely on somebody pulling up in front of the door, reaching and clicking their button. There's just going to be a transponder in the car that picks up the signal from some distance away. So that could speed up a couple seconds. The the yeah, that's right. something we definitely want to explore because right, you only have two two spaces to stack before you right. get onto Main Street. So, um, you know, that's that's um, those transponders have about a fifty foot range sometimes. So it's almost if, like a corner. If, if somebody remembers to push the button, no, you don't have to remember. That's the like thing. It, it's automatic. Yeah, it's like it's like oh. easy pass almost. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's just kind of batteries dying or fumbling yeah. for. Yeah. It. It sort of depends on how quickly that moves up. Yeah. Yeah. Whether that's yeah. yeah. And how noisy it becomes. Two, two, two stacks once here before you talk to the But I do, Nick, I do agree on your, uh, the, that, that bottom rendering right there. I mean, that's the corner that, I'll, that most people are going to see. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's actually the part of the building that will be most visible because it's what you see as you come down. Come down, um, come, down, come down the hill, correct? Yeah, so, you know, you, you, unfortunately, <clears throat> from the way this sits on the, the roadway and, and sort of the, the narrowness of the road, most people don't get a view of the front of the building. That's, that's not what people will really, what most people will see. Most people will see from that, um, from that corner. And that's where that, that sort of photo montage that we yeah. did when we said we yeah. need a little bit more brick there to tie it into all the yeah. buildings descending yeah. down Main Street. Yeah. Okay, so from us, you're going you're gonna to work on that parking layout. You have to get that compact space down, try to get close to 30%. That's what we've been pushing. Close to 30%? 30% compact. Um, I assume that the number is already 125, 1.25 with 37 spaces. Is that? Or half a park of fish eye. 1.17. I need another spot. Okay. <coughs> All right. Other anything else from the board? What's the height of the garage door? I'm sorry. What's the height of the garage door? Uh, it's 10 feet. 
higher than what you normally do in well, kind of residential, but they get some moving trucks off the street. It's kind of higher. Right. So why? <clears throat> So is the retail space still, I, I see a lot, uh, some of these dimensions changed. Is the retail space still only 20 feet deep? Or what was it before? 21, so it looks like it might have gone down to 20. Just a little bit, yeah, just a bit of thickness to the wall. But we're gonna try not to make it too much tighter just so it won't be viable as retail. Right, I guess that was really, that was my, my thought is you know, what I think what I want to understand is what kind of retail can use a space that's 20 feet deep, you know, especially, you know, there's no storage <coughs> here, there's no backroom space here. Um, you know, what is it that could go into a space like that? Uh, so I was uh, doing some research on this retail, and um, believe it or not, uh, most places you look at are smaller than you think. Like a f five Guys is two to 3,000 square feet. A, uh, Starbucks is 1,500 to 2,500 square feet. Right. Um, they don't need as much depth as you uh, think. 15 feet is their minimum depth, uh, depth requirement usually. So 21 feet they can make manage, but um, it would be, if it was a restaurant, it would be more of a, um, I'll say fast food, but like a, like a Chipotle or Five Guy, more of like a, you go up to the counter and order, and you can see behind the kitchen type places. Um, and then if it's a coffee shop, you can fit any yeah. people like this that. Is not good. Or, right, this or, is not, or or let's, let's call a spade a spade. Th this is not a place that's going to generate, be able to generate that much traffic. You can't pull up to it as a car and, you know, and, um, and there's not enough parking space around. And it's not quite urban enough. You're on the edge of the urban area that it's not going to generate enough foot traffic to have that kind of a, you know, sort of a... a you know, we might be generating traffic now, foot traffic, anyways. Some, but you could do a, a UPS you know. store, a FedEx store, along the yeah, long probably more well. like, like that, just so that we're sure that we're clear of, of, of expectations. Oh, I don't um, know. I mean, this is twice the size of the Starbucks that was on the corner of State and uh, yeah. the corner of State near my office. Yeah. <coughs> no, I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, Starbucks, absolutely. Um, you know, well, with the could, size of it, but get Comcast to move in yeah. there or Xfinity so that you can actually find them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a Verizon store would fit here fine. Uh, any like, mobile store would fit here. Um, I mean, there's options. Obviously, it's it's very hard to generate interest um, in a conceptual uh, mm -hmm. plan at this moment. But um, if we were to get permits, you know, it's something. One of the first things that we would do is start reaching out to retailers. Well, speaking of that, but but I guess you answered the question. It, you're you're looking at retail. It's it's retail that you're envisioning. Oh, no, I'm not not office. Yeah, I, I would like a. I think that's what the town wants. If you guys correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. It, it would be some kind of retailer to create a presence of the downtown. Would you even be able to have a restaurant due to uh, the ventilation and so forth? Uh, it's the reason why another reason why we raised the garage is to allow for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you would just need to allow to vent that up the <coughs> whole way up through the roof. Yep. Um, and when we were told from the town that they would not want anything vented out back, so it would be through the roof. Okay. Uh, public but, comments. I, I'm sorry, but you, if that's part of your plans, right, don't you need to, you need to plan that out early now. Which, you know, we don't, we don't have to see if it's going to be a restaurant or if you're thinking that it could be a restaurant. It's work that into the, the plans. We had problems with that in other buildings mm -hmm. that were of course, mixed use. Just um, to, there's a chase in here. Yeah. It's still very early in the plan development. No, I, yeah, definitely. Um, it, and I guess the other thing that, it, that jumped out, it looks like you remove the trash space and trying to get some additional parking um, that was in the garage. Um, but I also didn't see that trash space carrying up through the building that you did have. So that's certainly something that we still need to work out. Um, yeah, I think, right, what we're on the, or thinking now is that residents, if you go to the second floor plan, the residents can bring their trash to the second floor of the building. So four, three, and then those on two can bring it to this corner here. And from there, building management will take it out on the morning of pickup. Currently, the thing from the second floor down to the first. To
the management have a presence on site? Uh, it's something we have to negotiate with the uh, management team. It's a, it's a pretty small building from uh, having someone on site perspective, but it would definitely be a regional uh, property management company that has a lot of properties in the area and either have a regional office or a regional um, you know, staff in the area. Um, but it would either be on site or um, someone nearby that can handle any day-to-day -day activity. So how are you going to manage the open spaces and the roof deck if you don't have somebody on site? Um, there's FOB systems, security systems, um, anyone who's going to go out there is going to have to fob out. So you, have, you, know, um, you guys really hate your property managers, huh? <laughs> <coughs> okay. Get some public comments. Just state your name, please, for the, and address for the record, and make sure you've signed in as well. Um, my name is Ken. I'm in on I actually live in that White House, and that was one of my questions. Like, I, I don't own any bricks. Um, so, I wanted to know if you guys have pursuit, because obviously I'm not going to follow the that. But is that something that, upon loading, that you guys would do? Um, taking that out of the It's non-discussions. Um, yeah, there's, there's nothing heading that way at the moment. So then, um, back to like the traffic part that, was, that we were talking about, um, I know from experience that Green Street can sometimes back up six, six to eight car lanes if they can't make that left onto Main Street. So you already, so if someone's trying to come out of the garage, where they, you know, they're going to be sitting there waiting to try to get, if they're going um, left too. Because those cars are going to be blocking them. Um, I don't know if you have an Yes, and yes. And then um, coming down, and then also coming down from the center, you know, to try to turn left onto Green Street. You've got all these cars behind you honking because these cars aren't letting you go. The ones going towards the center. So it's just, obviously there's going to be a lot more of that. So if I can ask, what do you do in that case? Do you end up... Taking left, or do, is there a way that you go um, around the block or, that makes it easier, or do you, is there is there a way around I actually, that? If there's a, I shouldn't, but I basically am playing chicken. I'm, you just go for it, yeah. yeah. No, I, <laughs> you know, and I also walk to work, which I have to cross over from Green Street there, and use that cars not stopping or once yeah. stopping, and then you don't get they don't see. So even like pedestrians, it's not safe either. So it's just, and obviously, we've got already a crap load of, sorry, um, a whole lot of lights. We don't want to add another light, but it's a safety thing, too. It's important for both sides, you know, the pedestrian and drivers. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question for Phil Mark Fulking down the road. A question for the uh, potential developer, right? I assume that you've done some marketing studies right, which show you that probably the vast majority or a good percentage of these people that would be renting here are going to walk to the depot. And they're going to either take the train into Boston or they're going to take the bus to Oak Grove. Right, now, if you haven't done that, I don't know. They have uh, some magic in that pocket. Would you look at other developments like that that are close to public transportation and see whether or not X percentage could possibly be used in the depot? Or do you need a Ouija board? No, there's, there's data. Because then, then that says that all cars there don't have to load on the green screen. Well, we know that what we were trying to do is stress it, stress the system to see what happens. Do yeah. if 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 the the T stops working, right, and people start start doing that. But I do think from some previous work that there is numbers of the percentage of folks in the area that take commuter rail and or, or transit, mm -hmm. um, and it it is a it's a pretty good percentage. Do you remember off the top of your head? Uh, 
what that was. Eighty-four percent of people drive, and then the rest of that is mixed of the other yeah. uses. Actually, I do have the census data here. Yeah, so um, like twelve. Uh, yeah, twelve percent is the number that sticks in in my yeah, head. Um, yeah. So to be conservative, we didn't use that. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. And if you look at the April line. Reading is actually one of the more active um, state uh, stops has, on the Haverhill line. It has the highest boardings in the lightning uh, for for that line. Yep. And mm -hmm. it's actually a stat that surprised me as well. Is there's almost as many people going north as south on the train. And another point of clarification: in Tom's study, he used sixty percent, sixty-eight percent of the the people coming out of that drop driveway. He had him turning left on Green Street. Um, I, I thought I heard somebody say it was like 50-50 split or something. Right? Yeah, I, it was 60, okay. 68. Uh, I want to say 68. What was 65? 65. Okay. Go go left on towards yeah. Main Street. So, All right. Just just you, just for the yeah, record. Right. Yeah. Are, you, are, you okay with, are you okay with the 65, or you still want? I want to see. We. I I I think to to to. Put the um, question to, to rest if you can redo that with 100% and then. 100% to Maine and 0% yeah. to Maine. Yeah, and then we see what yeah. um, see what kind of stress that yeah. that Because what, what the number was saying <coughs> was that people back up, right? Mm -hmm. So almost, I'd almost think more people would go to Elliott. There is a way to get to 95, you know, when you go right, you keep this book. You just, you just more circuitous, but you can get there to 95. Mm -hmm. The back way. Yes, you can yeah. get into the you can get into the traffic pile up in any number of different ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 then, then you're turning around by Elliott onto Washington. Yeah, there, yeah, you don't want to get on. Yeah, yeah. No Washington and Elliott, it's worse. Yeah. 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 Would you ever do that? Would you ever go to Elliott, or would you more likely go to Main Street? I would do that on Washington. Yeah, because you can't take a right at that at the lights at 128 ties. So Washington even, yeah. Turn on red. Um, so even Washington Street ends up getting backed up. Okay. So you're saying even with the backup on green to Maine, you want to back it up even further? 100 well, we want to right. understand how bad it could be. I think yes. what you'll end up finding is that you'll probably only go down one level of service, and then we'll know that. That's what the that's what your the 68 percent said. said. No change in level of service, yeah. right? So at 100 percent, if there's only a one uh, letter grade, right. whatever. Yeah change in service, then we know that there's no impact. Do you know what the letter grade was? Yeah. You don't want to go into F. It's already F. It's already an F. <laughs> <It is. laughs> I think there the were both left left there, so. Were they? Yeah. We weren't in good. I don't go that way for a reason. Right. It's left. It's F. That's it. That's an F, yeah. Yeah. But in the, the AM. The left, what's the left turn out of the side track? Well, you can't get any worse than that, right? Well, actually, F plus. Would, does the software show it less than that? No. So then we can't understand the impact of it. Is that what you were, you were looking for, the coming out well, of the you, side drive? You, you'll have delay numbers, right? I mean, I, I don't yeah. care about after, the number, right. letter grade. It's after 120 number. seconds of delay, the model breaks down. So why it exceeds capacity. So it so just gives you an It's like having a jar full yeah. of water. You try to put more water in it, it doesn't. So you wouldn't actually be able to see the change in level of service. So your your statement is correct. <laughs> that it doesn't there's no impact, but that's you know it's already broken. Yeah, 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 yeah. No impact to a broken system. So you right. take that all with a grain of salt. And figure out what it means. Does that change yeah, much bigger to me? Do you guys have the same What's that? Much bigger Yeah, I, yeah. I don't think you can. <coughs> no, I think you're no wrong. impact on yeah. the system. Yeah. It's breaking okay. it even further, and it's taxing it even further. Well, <coughs> yeah. I guess my m the concern then becomes more about safety issues. I mean, like like was expressed, then people go for it and do. <laughs> You know, right. do silly things. So well, I mean, um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, certainly this project, any one project can't fix right. 
fix everything. That's why I said it has much bigger implications. But we want to understand what it, right. how it contributes, and if there are smaller things that can, we can do, then may mitigate some of that. Any other comments? Yes. Yeah, Barry Berman, Board of Selectmen. You guys will come see us about the parking on Main Street. I, I just have a question in terms of um, the 37 spots that you're attributing to the 30 units. Any of those um, dedicated for the retail? So there's none that are per se dedicated, but what we're going to propose to the town, if they allowed it, is almost doing like a reverse commute, like you see in um, public parking, where you would give the retail, you know, two to four parking spaces from the hours of, you know, your typical nine to five. And then after that, they would go back to a resident. There would be shared spaces. So weekends when everybody's home? Weekends would work? be, uh, it would when be most for most people actually going out using retail? It would be for resident. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, you talk about a Starbucks, which is great. Um, I'm just trying to think. I go up and down along Main Street, every coffee shop, whether it's the Dunkins, the New Nero's, the Starbucks down the road, they all have parking. If you don't have park, how it, I, I don't see how retail is going to work without some sort of parking, which means if you really want to make the retail work, you know, maybe you need more spaces for that, maybe less units. I just, I just, I just want to know the thinking that went into that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, yeah. If you want to make it, a, you know, if you want to make it a retail, active retail, yeah. That's one thing, is it, but it could be a, you know, it could be a law firm office. It, it, it could be an office thing where you don't have as many people going, but you still having people working that has a storefront, demonstration, sign, and life. Um, but if you want to make it active retail, um, for this part, I, I'm not seeing how this part can work. With, with the number of spaces that you have, with the number of units that you have. So, that's the wrong kind of stuff. But I guess where we're stuck a little bit, we're getting kind of a um, mixed opinion. You know, we, we hear that we want, you know, we want a downtown presence with more of a retail presence um, and not so much an office. Um, no, so that's great, but yeah. you need to be able to provide for it. So, it's, it's interesting, it's, it's, it's an, an interesting point under the, under the 40 hour. Uh, bylaw is that restaurants don't require any parking spaces. Right. So, I mean, no matter what the size is. <clears throat> so, and neither does retail. But if I was a restaurant, I, 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 hate, restaurant, yeah. I wouldn't invest nickel yeah. one until I know <clears throat> people want to eat at my place can actually get there. And we'll park them. Point well taken. Which is exactly the thinking. You don't want this, right? No one, no one wants this board f determining exactly how many spaces you, you, you want your business wants, right? You, as business owners, we want the business owners to figure out, yeah, what do you need for um, for a, a, a restaurant or a particular retail or Starbucks or, you know, or a vacuum cleaner store or whatever, whatever it is. So, you know, that's really why that, that that's laid out that way is because, you know what, if, if you can't provide the parking, you're not going to have the tenant. You'll need to do the pro forma on that and figure out whether knocking off a unit or two and increasing parking for your retail balances your sheet somehow. You know, you'll need to know that. Because what we, what I guess really what, what uh, Mr. Berman's getting to is <coughs> what we don't want and certainly what you don't want in, in, for the residential is an uh, empty storefront. So, you know, and whether that storefront ends up being um, full because it's more like a, a, a you know, a, a legal office. Maybe that's what's appropriate here now, um, and and make sure that we have the the parking and the needs to fit that. Maybe it is retail. I'm sure you'd rather it be retail, um, but let's make sure that there's the appropriate facilities for that as well. If, if that's the plan. Just to make sure you. Are aware of this the bylaw also specifies that not more than 33 percent of the ground floor can be used for office or institutional uses so you are going to need to look into retail and restaurant like yes. I know that's mm -hmm. what you're thinking but you know when you're going down that road if it looks like it's not going to end up that way just be you warned <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay no other questions want to continue this please
so it's probably going to be, you're looking at like probably 9.30, the 8th or the 22nd. I mean, I could schedule it at 9, but it'll be the same thing that happened tonight. It'll be pushed back. I'm almost positive. 8th or the 22nd. We, mm -hmm. you know, we would respectfully request the 8th because we're on some, we've got some permitting timelines that we're dealing with. Um, so we would keep it moving as quick as possible. Okay. We, we understand the wait and we appreciate the board's time and staying late. So thank you. Thank you. So we'll schedule it at 9. It's probably going to be more like 9 30. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Move that the CPDC continue the public hearing for the uh, 40 yard development proposal at. 467 Main Street until Monday, January 8th at 9 p.m.? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have some procedural uh, things we have to do. We have to sign a bunch of documents. Watch your sign. I saw the code. I didn't know who that was. Um, <coughs> we have lot releases for partner states, right? Um, yeah. You have form H, form K, and lot releases. Form K and lot releases. All of them. Any town object to it? Any engineering issues? The motion to do um, yeah. the Here's part of the states. Thank you. Um, it's, it's, the it's no, it's it's the covenant. It's the three party agreement for the bond and it's lot releases so the lot they can get building permits for the individual lots. I don't know how to word the motion. That you, it, that the board can endorse the Form H, Form K, and lot release request. I shall move. I'll second that. All in favor? I just I keep leaving them to water, but <sighs> that's crazy. And so now we have uh, what the same form K three party agreement and lot release for Randall Road extension. Yeah, and you already endorsed their form H at a different meeting. So now here's Randall Road. <coughs> Thank you. Sticky for that in your. Okay, we move that the CPDC endorse the three party agreement and not release for rental room subdivision. Second. All in favor? Why should I keep up my perfect street of not voting so far? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't voted wrong yet. There you go. Well, well since we had a. There's number. three. Um, do, what, do we need to sign this in triplicate? There's three. There, there are, are they different? I think they're different. Three different lots. Three different lots? They're all oh, lot one, lot two, lot three. Okay. It's always good to ask, though, because <laughs> I've been known to be wrong. 
Yeah, I can't even bring more than you. I can do something. All releases and a form K3 party agreement. Yeah, first thing, right? I guess Form K is the three party agreement. Yes, Form K is the three party agreement. I don't know these were with it. I don't know what they are. All together. Signature blocks, I assume we don't need to sign anything. Oh, yeah. No, I'm sorry. Okay, that's all we're doing tonight. Um, well, we should talk about the 2018 schedule because I need to post it if you guys agree to it. I agree to anything that produces the number of meetings we have. <laughs> so basically, there's a couple things going on. Number one is, um, I'm pregnant. Oh, congratulations. congratulations. Yeah, so I will be out of the office for a few months, probably during the summer, as it turns out. Um, so Jean and I were looking at the schedule for next year, and we already had like four different months where we had one meeting, so like April, November, December. And then I was like, if I'm going to be away for four months, for three months, like, should we just go to one meeting then too? And then it, so that's how it morphed into starting in April, April through December, one meeting a month. Um, the other thing that's going on is we don't really know what our staff capacity is going to be. Um, there's a lot of unknowns right now because we don't know about if there's going to be an override vote. We don't know if we're going to get additional staff. Um, it's just there's a lot of uncertainty. So we're kind of trying to plan conservatively um, on not actually having a lot of help during that time. Um, and then I figured with the schedule that we have right now with all the applications, keeping two meetings a month for the first few months of the year could probably work. And then Applicants will have plenty of advance notice that our schedule is getting reduced come April. Um, so they can hopefully plan around that. And then if you need to schedule a second meeting like to accommodate something, we can always throw that in there. Um, that's what that's about. That's all a good reason. Yes. Yeah. We'll do our part. So if you're not going to have any help, we'll do our part of not being helpful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you had to twist Jean's arm to go down to one. Actually, it was her suggestion because I had a full schedule, and then she was like, "Don't do this to me," because I mean, it, realistically, she might end up doing, you know, a lot of the work. With, like when Jesse left, and she was working every weekend, and it was crazy. So, I mean, obviously, we're both hoping that that doesn't happen, but we just don't know what's going to happen. Um, so. Now, Julie, didn't we add in limit, uh, time limits, very aggressive time limits, in when we redid the uh, zoning bylaws? I want to say we yeah, had what? like 10 days that um, something that the town had to respond back. An applicant comes in and they... The town yeah, to so com within. that's completeness. A lot of time frames come from state statutes. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll have to be something that's mm -hmm. tracked. I mean, not, not a lot of applicants are like... At your throat if you take 11 days for things like that um, but yes those will have to be um, tracked well I remember we were redoing it and whatever the time frame was well like five days that they had to respond back and I said well if if staff is overwhelmed things are gonna get approved automatically because nobody responded back in a very limited time frame so luckily we have applicants that are pretty understanding um, I've never been like threatened, like that they're gonna, mm -hmm. you know, like demand a <laughs> default approval. Like, I, I mean, anything possible. The key would be to respond back with denied, I guess. Not complete. <laughs> right. Yeah. Never, never um, complete. Yeah. I mean, I'm hoping yeah. that based on the amount of projects we've like just had in the last six months, we're gonna have a little bit of a slow down. I mean, we like, I can't imagine this pace is gonna continue. Well, we can dictate that if we decide that we're at capacity and that we are not, we are not entertaining anything. Not really. Sure. Someone wants to file a 40R application, you can't stop them. No, we can certainly not grant any waivers, including the 20 percent, the right. 20 I mean, units per acre. <laughs> right. We could argue. We, could we still need to deal with applications that come in. I'm just thinking. I know. I'm not yeah. trying to slow it down. I'm just saying. Knock on wood that I haven't yeah. jinxed yeah. us, but I'm. I just can't imagine. Yeah. I mean, pretty much every project that has been approved since I've been here, or before my time, 
needed something this fall. Like, as you're seeing, like, it, there's going to be some minor amendments. There's, and then there's tons of new projects that have come back. Every possible scrap of land that can be subdivided is past year. Don't say that. No, I know. <laughs> I know. Well, I know, I know of, <laughs> there will be some more. I know of a couple more that are coming. Um, but it's just, yeah. I can't imagine it could be any worse than this fall. I really can't. Just wait until construction starts. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not going to hold my breath, Dirty to be work. honest. Okay. Well, I mean, so. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? I'll vote this. The magic of left hand turns from this, my daughter's brand new car heading south in the far right lane.